yourself trapped in what scientists call a beer nado. The only way to escape is by drinking all the beer out of it. I mean, that makes sense to me. Also, if you don't watch and explain every single Sharknado movie, I'll kill you with laser beams from my eyes. Feels a little like a hat on a hat, but... Aerodynamics in this car cannot match the weight. Ooh. The first movie literally opens on sharks being chased by a tornado. Oh my god, I just realized that's what the name means. I thought it meant the sharks had joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I was like, that's a great get for those guys. Can't believe the sharks beat Ukraine in the punch. The Soviet Union's about to be in trouble. But. Actually, I guess not. Yeah, this got political. <laughs> yeah, it just starts. Dove into geopolitics. <laughs> <laughs> then we cut over to a boat manned by neither sharks nor tornadoes, but something much more dangerous: humans. They're fishing for sharks, which I think is called sharking. And the guy in charge says to toss them and bag them. But I'm assuming he doesn't mean toss them overboard, right? Because then how else would you bag them? But also, where else would you toss them? They're on a pretty small boat, so maybe he just means bag them? I don't know. I'm not a sh sharker man or a sharkist. And then we see a businessman type dude making a deal with a Captain Ahab type dude. He wants to buy all the sharks he's caught for $100,000, presumably for later use in Arby's beef and cheeses. I, I want to keep the video evergreen. They might not always use cheddar. Not some bland cheese. Captain Ahab says, <laughs> No way! I want a million dollars, and I, like Jake Tyler, will never back down. Then the businessman says, 500. Then Captain Ahab threatens him with a gun. And the, and the guy says, all right, fine, as long as we get the meats. And he slides over a tackle box full of money, and the captain says, sharks should be afraid of us. It is all very tense. Salud. Very Tarantino-esque. Then the storm gets worse, and dudes on deck are being eaten out by sh Sorry, eaten by sharks. And the businessman uses the distraction to steal the money back and says he's gonna now keep the money and the cargo. But how? He pulls out a gun and sneaks around, and the captain sort of chases him until they end up in a Mexican standoff, which is appropriate as this apparently takes place 20 miles off the coast of Mexico. And then the business guy states that his intention is to steal the boat, money, and meat, but the captain says, I don't think so, and shoots him in the leg. <laughs> the business guy doesn't shoot back, though, because maybe honor? Foggy glasses? And his bloody leg presumably attracts a shark that eats him. And then the rest of the crew is eaten, even though they weren't bleeding, they were just there. So did the shot in the leg really do anything? Were the sharks like attracted by the noise? Are they like dune sandworms? This movie is already asking some very profound questions about sharks. All right, you got all that? Did you write it down? Well, good, because it never comes up again. This is just like the director's nephew student short film, Captain Ahab and the Shark Meat Sweats, that they decided could be a fun cold open for the movie because from here, we cut to stock footage of beach stuff. You know, surfing, skateboarding, boats. You know, beach stuff. We also see two aquatically named dude bros, Finn and Baz, which kind of sounds like bass. Fish, if you say it drunk enough. And they're wandering around the beach. Baz is intrigued by this attractive wet woman, but Finn just wants to surf. What a f***ing some waves. Also, Baz Baz apparently had a jet ski just sitting on the beach unguarded. Where the hell were they walking from exactly? The D tanning salon? They are what? You know, we really don't talk like that, right? Anyway, Baz tows Finn out to sea so he can surf because apparently Finn is a lazy piece of shit. Then we cut to a bar where what Wikipedia calls a barmaid named Nova, which is not at all aquatic, sort of not quite flirts with what Wikipedia calls a drunk man named George. He tries to grab her butt and stuff as one does, as we all do, as everyone has done ever since the beginning of time and we'll do forever, but notices some scars in the exact shape of a bite mark. She got shark butt. A shark stamp, a tramp shark. He asks what the scars are from, but she won't say. I wonder if that'll ever pay off later. We then cut back to the wet woman, who I guess has been trying to pull that wetsuit over her shoulder for the past half hour, and then she heads out into the water with Finn to presumably catch and ride the saddest, shittiest little waves I've ever seen. Come on, come on. 
<gasps> but then, twist. A bunch of sharks attack and eat a bunch of people and Finn sort of limply yells, hey, get off of me. But it, it doesn't really help much, especially for this man sunning himself while fully clothed. Then the beach turns into Saving Private Ryan, but the sharks and Baz gets bit. <laughs> But Finn scares the shark away by honestly just sort of yelling at it. Ah! Baz makes it to the beach and Nova uses her last piece of actual clothing as a tourniquet for his leg. Thoughtful! Oh. Then they all head back inside the bar and it turns out Finn owns it and thusly Nova should not touch him. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Because hey, he's the boss. Seems like a perfect opportunity for her to quit on the spot so she can shove her hands down his pants, but... I think that's a different kind of movie. Anyway, the TV says the hurricane outside is the first ever to hit California, which is apparently a mostly true thing to say. Finn decides he's worried about his ex-wife and daughter, so he calls them, and we learn Finn was once married to what is now the half-embalmed ghost of Tara Reid. Finn says he wants to save them from the impending storm, but Tara says they're a hundred miles from the water, and he's like, you're exactly 6.6 .6 miles from the ocean. And she's like, what do you want from me, Tara Reid? Also, it's called Beverly Hills. I'll be fine. And he's like, fair enough, but can I come save my daughter, Claudia? And Tara Reid says, I've got a new boyfriend, and he'll protect us in case, God forbid, a tornado of sharks hits the house. Like, can you imagine? So that door is closed, but then a shark bursts through the window to the bar, <laughs> and Nova just narwhals the thing in the head with a pool cue. Hope you find your dad. Quick thinking. Also, in case you were wondering, this stock footage of Santa Monica Pier plays approximately eight times in the intro. Then more sharks attack, so everyone starts running, and Nova grabs this military-grade looking shotgun, and people keep falling down onto their back amidst the sharks, but the main characters all escape thanks to the drunk guy running around brandishing his personal stool that I guess he brings to the bar every day. Also, the Ferris wheel detaches and rolls away, squishing people and smashing buildings. So the bar is trashed. <laughs> They decide to just leave as a group and go save Tara Reid anyway because Lord knows she'll need it. Also, I know all the CG in this film is terrible, but that shaky cam could be way better. Look, I'll show you. Look, I'm, I'm doing this right now in After Effects. Doesn't that look handheld? Looks sick. We're on a tripod, you can't even tell. Wow. It's like Dave drank too much Natty Light before he filmed this. Whoa, how do I even sip? Whoa. Movie whoa. magic. They end up in traffic. And sharks eat a bunch of people there too. Oh, and Finn decides he needs to go help them out, though it's unclear. Like, what's he gonna do to help them? Just can't sit back and watch this. This scene, like every scene, is whatever the opposite of heart pounding is, largely because the music in this movie is shockingly understated. <laughs> I realize it's all probably stock music, but look, here's a stock song I wrote that's way better. Ooh, now I'm at the edge of my seat. Oh, and at some point the drunk dies. Uh, rip drunk. We'll always remember how non-sober you were and how that was your entire personality. Now, the only way they'll be able to get off the interstate is to drive through a small opening in some waves, but Baz, an Australian, quotes an old Australian proverb. You've got kangaroos loose in the paddock, mate. Which, in American English, translates to the freeway. It's covered in damn sharks. Apparently, they don't have a word for sharks in Australia. They just call them kangaroos, and you're supposed to use context to realize, oh, okay, they mean water kangaroos. Like the bitey kind of kangaroo. Anyway, Finn claims waves come in threes, which Scientific American says is not true. So he times it right and drives under the impending waves and towards the house housing Tara Reed's big old bosoms. They arrive, and Finn knocks on the door with his flat palms because I guess he never knocked on a door before. And I guess they don't cover that at Juilliard. But thankfully, Tara is somehow able to hear him and opens the door. And she's unsure if she should let them in. No, what are you doing here? But then a shark bursts out of a sewer drain and Nova shoots it out of the midair. So Tara's like, Fine, I'm inside. Once inside, we meet Tara's 26-year-old boyfriend. Oh, Shepard. And learn that Finn also has a son named Matt who is at flight school, which sounds a lot like they have a girlfriend in Canada. <laughs> then sharks attack and the boyfriend dies. The house kind of floods and is filled with sharks, but nobody bothers to go more than like maybe halfway up the stairs. So the shark battle results in a lot of blood and gore and a tasteful menstrual joke. Looks like it's that time of the month. They decide to go to, you know, flight school to pick up Matt and Finn causes a distraction so they can run to the car. Will Finn make it? Yes, because he popped up out of the flower bed.
Where, how, where did he come from? Anyway, now they're driving and the house collapses because, well, sharks. They're like the termites of the sea. Nova asks Finn why he has just so many freaking shotgun shells in his car and Finn says, Semper Paratus. And Connie's like, Dad, shut the hell up, be furious. And he's like, what do you mean? That just means, be prepared. Isn't that like a Nazi song? Are you really saying that right now? Can't you be serious? <laughs> Is that why she thought Finn wasn't serious, despite the fact that they're actively using the shotgun shells to fight sharks? And it's actually very fortunate that he was prepared for this highly specific possibility, but yeah, dads, am I right? Always telling Latin dad jokes to explain why they carry live ammo in their Jeep. Classic dad. Nova then chambers the shotgun and Finn admits, that is pretty hot, much to Tara Reed's horny dismay. I guess she's looking for a rebound post dismembered 26 year old boyfriend. <laughs> and maybe the bar being smashed means Nova is out of a job and free to receive a plowing from her no longer boss? Keep watching to find out. Finn drives by a maybe abandoned school bus and decides to stop and help out because that's what his defining character trait is, I guess. And Tara Reed channels her inner Michael Jordan and says, F them kids. Stop it. Get some help. Claudia is a kid and I'm, I might still be fertile. You don't know. And Finn is like, nah, I should repel from that bridge onto the school bus because that's also the first thought I had when thinking of ways to help those kids. Are we really gonna do that now? Now? Who doesn't have repel gear in the Jeep at all times next to the shotgun ammo and tackle box full of Magnum condoms for emergencies just like this one. And to clarify, only the repel gears for the kids. The other stuff is for, uh, it's for a different emergency. <laughs> Okay, he doesn't need the... Anyway, so Finn starts saving all these kids, both from impending sharks and the pedophile bus driver. There's other grown-ups coming, okay? And evidently it's successful enough, even though it requires Baz to single-handedly pull up 30 children. Finally, Finn gets pulled up and, ah, no, sharks! <laughs> but it's okay because Claudia and Tara tell him, no, watch for the sharks! So, He's ready for it. Then a tornado strikes and the actors were all presumably told to pretend they're dodging things and they just fix it in post. <laughs> then we see the pedo guy standing center frame by himself away from the rest of the cast. And I don't know if you've ever seen a horror movie, but this is a surefire sign that he's about to die and, and yeah, he's smashed. <laughs> they drive away, but a shark lands on the roof of the car and somehow manages to hold on with its Stomach? Until they remember the shark's only natural weakness. And they shoot it off and then they need to abandon the car because apparently somebody hit the self-destruct button. They go into a convenience store where they watch the world's longest news alert. Or maybe not. And it seems like things are gonna get better because Baz mentions the eye of the storm must be over, despite, you know, the eye of the storm being actually the safe part of the storm. But just in case he's wrong, er, they go apparently rent another truck from a movie car store. Oh, nice. Then there's this scene where they outrun some cops and then they end up at an airport across from a retirement home, which sounds like it'd be an absolute breeding ground LLC for chlamydia. <laughs> More like crab native. All those horny people on vacation and retirees so close together, somebody get a mop. <laughs> anyway, now they're in a hangar wandering around looking for Matt. And Nova hears some rustling in a closet and slowly approaches it with her shotgun just in case there's a shark hiding in the closet. Oh, but it's Matt. I'm Matt. There's no real reunion here. No hugs, no hey Matt, it's me, your dad. Matt's just part of the gang now because connecting scenes cost money that could be better spent on the not CGI. Then a woman stands center frame away from the rest of the cast and well, <laughs> oh, we're gonna have twice as many as we normally have of those. That makes sense. I'm telling you right now. Then the gang heads to a surplus store and Matt and Baz decide they're gonna try to build some bombs. This is a bomb. To kill the tornadoes. Bombs. Bombs? Bees? Which Fine. Semper Paratus. Matt also hits on Nova, so we're clearly building towards a family foursome while Sharknado's explode in the background, and I'm, I am here for it. I came for you first. Not hard enough. He shows her a freaking gnarly scar he apparently got just by falling off a slide. Nobody thinks this is cool. And she admits, yeah, her scar is from a, a 
A shark bite. It did come back. And apparently she got that shark bite at the same time she had to watch her grandpa get eaten by sharks. Oh, 1100 men went in the water. And one little girl came out. It's such a compelling story that Matt decides, Now I really hate sharks too. Which is just a cute way of saying he didn't give a shit about that story and he's still mostly looking to get down. Also, turns out Claudia is mad at her dad because he likes Tara again and also maybe he likes Matt, but he doesn't like Claudia enough. Are we really gonna do that now? Now? I repeat things for emphasis. Emphasis! But not for long, I guess, because the conversation is never finished. Or maybe they figured it out off screen. I don't know. They decide the best way to bomb a tornado is to fly into it, even though they have perfectly functional cars that would presumably be much better at quickly getting into and out of a tornado than a freaking helicopter. And in fact, Baz does load bombs into the car just in case the helicopter thing doesn't work out, but the helicopter bombing actually works fine. Bombs. 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 That worked. For the first couple. Oh crap. Because actually there's more than one Sharknado making the movie's title a complete misnomer. Oh my God. It should be called Sharknados. On the ground, Finn chainsaws a shark out of the air, which makes me think they could also just throw chainsaws into the tornado, right? I mean, that'd be cool. Also, these old people with chlamydia are pretty worried <laughs> because sharks are falling into their pool. <laughs> and based on this randomly inserted shot, their pool is approximately 50 feet deep and just freaking full of sharks. Unfortunately, Nova gets eaten by a shark <laughs> and it mildly upsets Matt. No! who crash lands the helicopter <laughs> leaving one tornado yet unbombed. Then a shark flies through a sign and we hear people screaming, but there's, there's nobody around. <laughs> Maybe it's Nova screaming from inside the shark? Nah, that'd be too ridiculous. Anyway, then Finn does use the car to bomb the last tornado because Baz was unceremoniously killed at some point. <laughs> And then Finn gets eaten by a shark. But he's got a chainsaw, so he cuts his way back out. And oh, look at that, Nova was in there. And I guess she survives. And speaking of menstrual jokes, tell me this doesn't look like the world's best maxi pad commercial. New four wall protection from Stay Free. Superior protection against leaks. Nova reveals to Matt that her real name is Jenny Lynn. And I honestly, I forgot about that until now. I don't think it comes up in the next five, five movies, unless it does. It's a little hard to keep it all straight. And then Tara kisses the chunk viscera all over Finn's face. And then thankfully we cut to credits before the four of them just start going down on each other and rolling around naked amidst the shark guts. And then it says Finn, get it? Okay, this is taking forever. Now you have to double fist the beers. I don't want to go too fast. It's important to stay hydrated. Chug, 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 Oh my chug, god. Chug. Well, look who's back from La La Land. Holy sh! The ante is immediately upped with a freaking air shark? Oh, it's just a plane. Got me good, Sharknado 2. That's called a metaphor, kids. That's a metaphor! Anyway, we immediately learn that this is a classy-ass plane because they serve cold-ass Coors Light. Not a bunch of shitty natty light. And the stewardess is a purple-haired Osborne. Classiest of all, the air shark has April and Finn seated aboard. And they're engaged again, or something. She's got a ring, basically. Even better, they're celebrities now because Finn... I didn't write that. Oh no, April wrote a book about Finn's experience, except it's not at all about Finn's experience because it's clearly just a Sharknado survival guide full of helpful tips like what all the buttons mean on your Samsung Galaxy Tab. Trudy Riveting. Hey, who's got a book? Who's got a f***ing book? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I got a book. I cannot believe how lazy this sh is. <laughs> it's very uh, uh, Dr. Jordan Breeding-esque in that way. April signs her name right over the words though because she's a celebrity now. She doesn't give a sh She'll sign your damn baby with poison lead if she wants to. It's revealed the couple is headed to New York City where Finn grew up and they're gonna do a book signing. They invite the stewardess, even though technically her book, I mean, it literally just got signed. But uh, anyway, Finn appears to have a little PTSD. How much fun do you think that was? But it's nothing that couldn't be fixed with a hot slice of New York pizza. Finn sees a flying shark in a storm out the window and freaks out. But what's even scarier is the plane is flown by the dude from Airplane. I mean, look at the man's form. Now Finn sees someone on the wing. Some thing. So he calls the attendant to 
What, get it off? It's bulky, but I consider it carry-on. Actually, his plan is unclear. Oh, hey, it's Will Wheaton. People say I look like him, but do I, though? <laughs> Very clearly a Charlie Day, Nick from New Girl combo. <laughs> okay. All right. Does Natty, does Natty make you have to poop? Poo -poo 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 -poo. Or are these two separate events? Next time we're upgrading. People still doubt that Finn's actually seen flying sharks because I honestly don't know. That's a thing that literally just happened like last year. And, okay, there we go. It's a full on shark cane and a shark flies in the engine exploding it. And the pilot's like, I've never seen anything like this. Dude, I sure hope not. You'd have to be on some hardcore psychedelics to see flying sharks during a routine aerial commute. Okay, we do actually learn what the stewardess can do if sharks attack the plane. <laughs> die. But it's not like the actual pilots do any better and they're bitten and sucked out of the plane. You know who doesn't get sucked out? The stewardess who was never strapped in. You know, just once, I'd like to be a sh screaming extra in a disaster movie. Dave, make me a disaster movie so I can be a shitty screaming extra in it. The sharks kill Will, obviously, and bite off April's hand as she's half sucked out a hole in the plane, but not before she's handed a gun by an FBI agent to take out some sharks as she falls out of the plane to her death, I guess. Anyway, Finn crash lands the plane. <laughs> Though it's unclear how or why he's able to do that. He's a famous surfer, right? <laughs> I know the movie is dumb, but he literally has no fear or confusion, and at one point confidently tells the radio tower, I'm gonna put down the landing gear and hang for it. There are a million buttons, Finn. How do you know where the gears are? <sighs> why does that make me upset? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, now we get terrible opening credit graphics over stock footage of New York City so we can emotionally prepare for the level of effort to come. This is also written by Thunder Levin. Never forget. Now we get a happy family of four who won't stop touching each other. Oh. Like, God, get a room. I bet they all sleep in a communal bed. I'll play all day, me and you. Apparently, this is Finn's sister and brother-in-law and his stupid nephew and niece, but who cares about them? A few throwaway lines suggest that Finn was best friends with the brother-in-law, who just so happens to look exactly like the front man for Sugar Ray. I thought I was Batman. But they stopped being friends after Sugar Ray maybe started dating Finn's sugar sister. It was the end of the dynamic duo. Even though they've been married for like, what, 20 years or so now? Get yeah. over it, Finn. The sugar family separates as the sugar boys head to a Mets game with the guy from 30 Rock. Just like old times, right? And the sugar girls go to get cultured at the Statue of Liberty with two of the mom's horny old friends. Oh my god, hot mama. Cut to Matt Lauer slumming it and Andy Dick probably right where he should be. Okay, I can see you're upset. Don't let him lick you, Finn. Mm, really? As Finn pushes April on a gurney towards surgery, <laughs> move out of the way. He angrily yells, No, I don't have a comment. Get that camera out of my yeah, face. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't he just give a comment to reporters outside? I'm not crazy. That's not a good look, Finn. April mentions to Finn that she thought the shark that bit her had a big scar and acted like he knew her. The shark kept chasing me. Finn says that's impossible, but counterpoint, this is a second Sharknado movie in as many years. It's like Kevin Garnett says. You should be butt ass naked. Oh look, now Kelly and Michael are slumming it. Very scary. And, and again, Billy Ray Cyrus is right where he should be. In time, she should be able to make a full recovery. And here's a Weather Channel lady that the movie seems to think I should know, but she's talking about a southerly shark wind. Like that's a thing. This is starting to feel like a cameo NATO. Matt, this is nuts. In here, right Dave? Like a cameo, like a, it's a tornado. You remember? Finn's sugar sister realizes her brother has landed and been calling her over and over, so she finally calls him back and he's like, you gotta get back to the mainland because there's like a tornado of sharks coming. She's like, okay, sounds good, but you've gotta go to the Mets game. I gotta get to the ballpark. To get your brother-in-law because he turned his phone off so he could spend more, even quality -er time with his son. Sugar sister and her milfy friends notice a fairy very dramatically. Hey, looks like the fairy's there. And they hop on board and ah, 
One of the MILFs gets eaten. <laughs> and not even out, just up. Hey, look, it's Al Roker. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a joke. It is not, my friends. Okay, so I'm gonna try, here, here's the thing that happens in the movie. Are you ready? 30 Rock inexplicably bumps into the hypochondriac from Scrubs and expositionally exclaims that he's a former famous second baseman and he out loud wonders why he's slumming it down here with the regular fans instead of in some private box to which the former baseman explains It's my last time at bat and all I wanted to do was hit a home run from my pops. Which I guess is a thing he regrets for some reason and he can't get the game out of his blood. All of which is not really an answer to the question, but also doesn't really make sense as a story in its own right. God, I love sports. Umbrella strike. Dang it. Finn rides in a taxi driven by the guy from Taxi. What's the inside of a shark smell like? Who talks a whole lot of bullshit while the music blasts like it's an action sequence. just driving in a taxi. Finn finally arrives at the game, but before he can get his brother-in-law, a woman named Sky, who he used to date in high school, and who also was in Kill Bill. Now we make movies in Hollywood, and sometimes they're not real. Shows up and kisses him on the mouth. Wow. He kind of says, hey, I'm still with my wife again, or whatever. I'm with April. We're divorced. And Sky's like, ah, damn. But also she's, with the brother-in-law inexplicably? How is this spending quality time with your son if you've also brought two other random adults? As of this recording, it's possible I just don't understand father-son bonding, but my son's due date is February 13th, so maybe I'll do a follow-up video to show how we bond and or kill sharks together. But okay, the game is suddenly canceled because of falling snow. Also sharks. <laughs> The gang grabs bats while this random old man just, he runs his little heart out. I mean, look at that guy go. <laughs> oh, there's a little chunk in that one. We're not faking this for you guys. I'm drinking beers and they're bad. And it's like 12.30 PM. It's really early in the day. But it's not just that little old man. All these extras run for freaking forever in this movie. They've earned their checks. Eventually, they reach the subway and everybody takes a well-deserved break. <laughs> It's a bit tough to relax though because some ass with an unplugged electric guitar won't shut up. Although, given how this movie is gone, this is probably a Kurt Cobain cameo, returning from the dead to get a piece of that Sharknado pie. Yeah, yeah. But it's not all sunshine and teen spirit in the subway system because A, where is this damn train? And the maintenance tunnels are flooding with Oh, okay, and sharks. But most terrifying of all, the tunnels are about to be flooded by a pedophile. You should really be fresh too, you know. So, between the flooding teen spirit sharks and pedophilia, they decide we're in trouble. And after working out the extras a bit more, <laughs> our heroes catch the same taxi as earlier. So all of that did nothing. <laughs> They tell the taxi driver they need some weapons, but then there's a weird debate about how they won't be able to buy guns and bombs because this is New York, idiots. They don't wanna go to Jersey. But they decide to try anyway, because... Semper Paratus, right? Finn grabs some propane from a real character named Vinny. Well, look who's back from La La Land. Before nabbing a literal sword just on display in the middle of the street, while Sugar Ray and Sugar Sun grab the necessary equipment to build flamethrowers out of super soakers from a bodega. No propane, but I found this. Maybe New York City isn't that safe, is it? Liberals. Oh, and April, who I forgot about, escapes the stupid hospital. Presumably because as a creative, her health insurance doesn't cover shit. <laughs> she might escape with a fire truck, she might not. We'll, we'll circle back to that. Everybody else hops back in the taxi, but the damn thing capsizes, which only mildly annoys the characters. Holy shit. Sky pivots from trying to bang Finn to trying to bang the Sugar Son. I got you, baby. While Sugar Senior apparently is legitimately very cold because if not, he is really acting his ass off with all this arm rubbing. Thankfully, they're able to Indiana Jones their way to safety, except, oops, not the annoying cab driver. 
Ned, forcing Finn to literally hop shark to shark like an agent in Matrix Reloaded. Jump the shark. They reach the hotel they've apparently been trying to get to this entire time, and Finn takes Sky to the roof to probably do filthy things with her body, and also to throw propane bombs into the Sharknadoes, leaving the sugars on the ground floor. Sky and Finn exposit some of their shared history, and it sounds like they didn't end up together because Sky's dad was racist against white people? That's... And my daddy didn't love you. Meanwhile, the women have left the ferry and are forced to run from Lady Liberty's severed rolling head. It's not entirely clear why it's moving so fast, considering the wind isn't pushing any presumably lighter cars or people. But regardless, they steal a trash truck, and they survive and grab a few city bikes for the world's most fevered and compelling chase scene. Fortunately, the raw intensity becomes too much for the second MILF, and she succumbs. <laughs> Eventually, the sugars are united in total, and it feels so good. Oh my god, thank god. <laughs> Sugar Sister demands to know why Sugar Ray didn't stop Sugar f the father-in-law from going to the roof to blow himself in the sky up, and Sugar Ray says he tried, which is a bald-faced lie. He made literally no attempt. Sugar Ray is a cow. What's that sugar guy? I'm your fucking ass. So whatever, Finn and Sky are on the roof and they consolidate their supplies, including products lifted from a toy store called YOLO Be Us, which sounds offensive to me, but I, I don't know how or why. Sky demands to know if Finn is sure that his plan to throw bombs by hand into a tornado full of sharks will work, and he which is about the most honest thing in this movie. Thankfully, Sky has brought along a slingshot, which they fashion into a bomb launcher. It initially doesn't work, so they soar to shark in half. They double down though and make a double bomb, which also doesn't work. Why isn't it working? I don't know. Bombs worked in the first movie. Did tornadoes suddenly become bomb proof? Nobody knows. Even the Sharknadoes are tougher in New York. So naturally, they continue increasing strength exponentially and fashion together a quadruple bomb. And I think it works, but I'm also not really clear on what happens besides the creation of a bunch of fire sharks. Crap! You're just making this up as you go along. To escape said fire sharks, Sky and Finn run downstairs, but oh no, it's now flooding downstairs, so the sugars start running upstairs. But confusingly, it's not like the streets outside the hotel are flooding, it's just that the hotel is apparently airtight and the water isn't leaking out the door. So if they just opened the door, they'd be 100% fine. But they don't, obviously, because that wouldn't allow them to meet up with Sky and Finn and find themselves stuck between the proverbial flood and a fire shark, as they say. Finn initially just really goes for it, trying to open a side door. <laughs> but it ain't happening. We're trapped! Thankfully, Finn and Sugar Ray used to be known as the dynamic duo because of their bar fighting prowess. So they pull an incredible bait and switch where Sugar Ray literally just yells at a shark. Hey, over here! and then hides like the coward he is while Finn grabs an ax and kills the shark after waiting, I think like 10 seconds for it to attack. Hard to see how this plan would work in a bar fight that wouldn't end up in them going to jail, but I've never been in a bar fight while Sugar Ray fights children in the street. Then Finn uses the ax to open the door. They escape the hotel and are greeted by April in a fire truck. Again, last we saw her, she was crying in the hospital, but cool. I escaped somehow. So all right, they're on the ground and it turns out there are still two other Sharknados and if they meet, it'll create a shark cyclone, a shark clone. Al, what's going on? Which sounds like a movie about a shark dealing with the moral and ethical implications of cloning, which I would rather be watching. What? At this moment. Also, the shark clone will destroy the whole city or something, maybe. The mayor shows up and says some shit and gives Finn a chainsaw. Then Finn decides what they need to do is use some Freon tanks on the top of the Empire State Building to freeze the storm and then use the building itself to electrocute the storm. I don't understand. Did you hear that? I think Neil deGrasse Tyson just died. Pour one out into my mouth. Sorry, Neil! 15 characters mention they're running out of time and need to hurry. Specifically, Finn needs to hurry because for whatever reason, they're putting the fate of the city in his hands instead of like the cops or the military. 
or Al Roker. All you can do is just shake your head, Al. But before he starts running up there, Finn gives an impromptu speech about being New Yorkers, including such powerful lines as, They're sharks, they're scary. No one wants to get eaten. Then he chainsaws a random shark. <laughs> and Sky run up to the top of the tower alone, but things get rough. Oh, shoot. And April shows up with a makeshift saw blade hand to run interference, which how dare you stand where he stood. Sky heads to the Freon tanks and reconnects some wires or something because I guess she's a Freon tank expert. What the hell is she doing and how does she know how to do it? I don't know, but uh, okay, yeah, she doesn't do a good enough job and the gets unplugged, so she has to stand there and manually hold the cables together so that the, the Freon can channel into the shark NATO. Oh my God, I think Bill Nye just died. Okay, so I guess the plan was to explode the tanks with lightning or something, which they managed to successfully do, but they also explode themselves directly into the storm. Sky is killed, naturally. But the computer generated version of Finn manages to kill some shit and fly through some sharks. He's ultimately fine because he rides a shark onto the top of the Empire State Building, which honestly is just science. <gasps> oh no, oh fuck, I think Stephen Hawking died. He's already dead. Oh, thank God. You're an idiot. <laughs> On the ground, New Yorkers combat all the falling sharks with whatever random crap they have on hand. Now, technically, sharks can only survive out of water for like five minutes, and that's assuming they also survive dropping over a thousand feet from the sky, but what's the fun of waiting inside until it stops raining sharks? Instead, New Yorkers pull such big-brained battle tricks as hucking live chainsaws into a tornado, and I know, that I suggested that in the last movie, but those were very different circumstances. In this circumstances, what happens when the tornado ends? There are a lot of people on the street about to get chainsaws dropped all over them. Even worse, what if a shark grabs a chainsaw and then goes on a rampage? You've armed the sharks, you lunatic! We've developed a system to establish a beachhead and aggressively hunt you and your family. Also, I'm a bit unclear how a flamethrower super soaker works exactly. Like, what are the mechanics of it all? <laughs> Where is Elon when you need him? Oh, he's being a useless idiot? Sorry. Sorry? Back on top of the tower, Finn somehow recognizes that inside one of the dead sharks is April's hand with a gun still attached, so he reaches in, pulls out the hand and gun, and shoots some other sharks with it. <laughs> to get overly pedantic here, but that arm is chomped off at the elbow. Well, April appears to have only been bitten off at the wrist. Does that mean her arm has been growing back inside the shark? If they leave that arm for too long, will it grow into a full second April? Holy shit, that's the most exciting thing that's happened in this franchise so far, and might be foreshadowing. Finn removes the wedding ring from the severed arm and, and repurposes it. He could also just be cutting his losses now that the backup romantic option died in the storm. On the ground, a fireworks truck explodes for no reason. No! And we get a classic outtakes credit sequence with a bunch of people the movie seems to think I know. Good screen, baby. Oh, I know that one. In case I didn't make this clear before, the, the house has been picked up by the beer NATO and it's floating around and now it's in space. <gasps> Whoa, that is cold. Bridge is gone. Sharknado 3 opens with a pseudo James Bond intro, which is pretty concerning to me because it suggests that we're moving away from the grounded human elasmobranch drama that the series is known for in favor of something silly. Consider me not stirred. It's like shit. Smash cut from there to Finn running around yet another recognizable American locale, Washington, D.C. He's picked up by a black Secret Service SUV and told President him, needs you right now. A Secret Service agent warns that either there's a storm coming or there's a storm. <laughs> Honestly, it's a toss up for me. There's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. While he drives one tire ahead of the storm, Finn calls April and tells her his car died, which I 
guess is why he was running around. April, for her part, is apparently now pregnant. Careful, slow down. But still only has one hand. I guess it didn't grow back. I'm just saying it's okay to ask for a little help. And they're still sponsored by Subway, so. <laughs> also, weirdly, there are a bunch of people protesting against the sharks. I'm not sure how sharks tie into public policy, but if this is the kind of thing that's getting protested in the shark averse, then maybe it's some sort of utopia where we've set aside our partisan differences to instead focus Focus on being devoured whole by the weather. Man can dream. Anyway, Finn eventually gets into the White House and immediately heads to a stage for a ceremony hosted by Regal Cinemas. Maria Menounos. Oh, sorry. Apparently Finn's not in Washington, but rather... Washington, D.C. <laughs> I don't know where they get these freaking actors. Regardless, Finn is presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Mark Cuban. Apparently the role was originally written for Sarah Palin, this is not a joke, who refused, and then, and then it was offered to Donald Trump, but he took too long to decide, and then when Cuban was cast, Trump threatened to sue the film. Also not a joke, and Coulter is in this movie, so yeah, okay, actually this is a full-on dystopia. They're wrecking our schools, our hospitals, our roads. Good news, Sugar Ray is back, and he is in rare form, opening with a joke about how, compared to Finn, I'm the good looking one. <laughs> which is actually not at all how in-laws work, but still very funny. Also, hey Lou Ferrigno, not one to be left out, the mayor of New York City is also at this party and awards Finn a functional golden chainsaw because, well, the writers are already pretty much out of ideas. Good thing we're not even halfway through this damn series. Uh-oh. Finn can apparently sense, or maybe smell, impending Sharknado storms now, and his, his sniffer is catching whiffs of a real doozy on the horizon. And wouldn't you know it, he's right. Dude got storked. Stork. The Lincoln Memorial gets blowed up as well as the awards ceremony itself, and then the mayor dies, and, <laughs> and then Maria dies, and then, <laughs> and then Sugar Ray and Ann Coulter surf down some stairs on presidential portraits, <laughs> and then Finn and the president retreat to his underground bunker when somebody mentions that Finn isn't even remotely cleared for whatever top secret sh is down there, Cuban pulls a Trump and just sort of claims that Finn now has top secret clearance and or everything down there is declassified now. Security clearance is really just, it, it's really all about what your heart tells. I just cleared him, let's go. Of course, it's all moot anyway, because despite the bunker being one of the most secure places on earth, according to the movie, there are still somehow sharks in the room. No for guns. <laughs> Finn grabs a sword off the wall to fight sharks, which, side note, seems like a terrible place to store a sword you could just pull off the wall, right? Right outside the president's bunker? You could get all the way down there with no weapons and just impale him right there. Bad security. More like a burnt NATO. The sword isn't enough, so they go to an armory to grab guns while somebody else vacuums a shark. Apparently, Cuban has in the past advocated on behalf of the sharks, which, how, why? Isn't that like advocating for terrorism? I don't understand, but he's apparently changed his mind because nobody attacks my house. Also, something something Shark Tank Joe. But Mark has something left to say. Where they fight some sharks and Cuban fires his shotgun with his middle finger like a regular idiot, but then he throws a grenade down the hallway like an extreme idiot. How do you feel about people that explode your house? I hate this action sequence, just in case anybody is curious. <laughs> Ooh. Eventually, Finn and Cuban aim for the bushes while the White House kind of just blows up. Several characters then meet up with them and, and, and they help Iwo Jima a shark. Thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for winning the war for us. Cue title card with an embarrassment of painted boobies. Eat your heart out, Michelangelo. Sistine Chapel, my dude. The tornado, I guess, just sort of dissipated because it's clearly no longer a problem. So let's go check in on Finn's daughter who has had a stunning sexy glow up since the first movie. I'm your daughter. And also let's check in on his Bo Derek looking mother-in-law. Love the new hair by the way. Oh, thank you. They're hanging out with April at Universal Orlando Resort because product placement. Finn decides that he's gonna drive down to Universal Orlando Resort to meet up with everybody since most flights across the East Coast are canceled worse than Louis C.K. That's not usually my problem. These days my problem is very simple. It's trying to find a place in my house where I can masturbate. <laughs> Which is to say, they'll be back up at some point, but not like immediately. 
Finn drives through a town covered in fog and screaming and death for some reason. I guess another Sharknado has hit this random town and brought with it Stephen King's The Mist. <laughs> the Sharknado also apparently brought Frankie Muniz armed with some sort of futuristic cannon and some suspiciously familiar breasts? Oh, hey, it's Nova from the first movie, now reinvented as a shark punisher. And apparently she's been tracking Finn and trying to do something about the Sharknados with her armored RV. I think you're gonna love what we've done with the place, come on. They're somehow partnered with the National Weather Service, but secretly, because I guess people don't like them bombing tornadoes. And Nova apparently has <laughs> post-traumatic shark disorder. Because, ha <laughs> ha! the troops. It's polarizing. And reveals that sharks live in the sky now and eat birds and they learn to breathe outside of water, proving that any fish that suffocated on land prior to this movie are wimps. Coming up against a full grown 800 pound tuna with his 20 or 30 friends, you lose that battle. And they decide they're going to drive Finn to Universal Orlando Resort if he wants. I don't know, man. It's just, it's the plot. It's, there's plot stuff. You got to have a plot. Here's a shark graph. I've been wanting to show you this. Look. Also, Matt Lauer and the majority of today are back and the Sharknado producers definitely have some sort of dirt on them, right? Do they have proof of a snuff film produced by today or something? Do they have evidence of extreme sexual misconduct? <laughs> oh, it's that. I guess that sort of sours this movie, but at least they've still got more wholesome cameos from Jared Fogle. Love that guy. Almost as much as he loves sub sandwiches. And children! <laughs> Speaking of, Finn's super hot daughter has a super rebellious hot friend that will ditch all her obligations at the first sign of a cute boy. Just like Jared. <laughs> Forgot about that joke. <laughs> oh, Jared. You fing pervert. On second thought, I'm actually gonna sit this one out. The daughter gets paired with another boy on a roller coaster and forgets her phone in a locker. That's the point of this scene. Also, hey, Michelle Bachman. So many cool conservative cameos in this movie. Uh, are they growing in size? It, it appears that they are. The Sharknado has finally hit Universal Orlando Resort and drops a couple sharks down a water slide. Somehow, this forces April to turn her clearly just a black glove on a functional and present hand into... <laughs> While they battle these unexpected sharks, the rest of Universal Orlando Resort is entirely unfazed. After all, this is the studio that brought us Jaws. You know, I'm fishing here. Don't leave me hanging. But okay, I guess we're just cutting between these two stories forever because we're back with Finn and Frankie and fun bags and oh no! The bridge is gone. So they go to a military airbase where apparently they know people who will probably give them an airplane. Frankie Munez mentions that at least they're not dealing with zombies, which sure sounds like a fun bit of foreshadowing, but I assure you it is neither foreshadowing nor fun. What is fun, however, is that one of the first soldiers they encounter is an actual porn star. Permission to stare freely? Apparently, because Finn's son is in the military with all the porn stars, that means the commanding officer of this base is willing to let him take one of their supersonic jets. That was easy. Fortunately, this mysterious son, who we haven't seen since the first movie, also taught Nova how to fly the aforementioned fighter jet. So that's convenient. I mean, she doesn't know how to open the damn plane window, but it's fine. She's great at the flying part. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's only room on the fighter for two, and Frankie Munez is the least sexy of the three, so he stays behind to get all his limbs bit off. Caleb is dead. And self-destruct the van to buy time. I mean, the sharks are falling from the sky, but it can never hurt to blow shit up. Also of note is that this movie clearly uses fake guns and flash effects, which is great news for the cinematographer. Alec Baldwin, take note. This movie makes me want to snort some shark again. Now they're in the air and here's some stock footage of NASCAR because apparently these movies are secretly conservative propaganda, but I'm struggling to understand how or why. I mean, what do conservative values have to do with a blood red wave of powerful predators destroying everything different than them and consuming it for sustenance? <laughs> anyway, oh, no. sharks start blowing up the race. So Nova and Finn decide to blow up the nearby Sharknado. They do. <laughs> but a shark hits their plane, causing them to crash and lose the vast majority of their clothing, which is the first truly inspired idea in the movie so far. Thankfully, 
Eventually, they managed to crash on Universal Orlando Resort grounds, so they didn't really need to fly any further or wear any more clothes anyway. <laughs> Oh, right, and speaking of, the daughter and her friend kiss some boys and ride some stuff, and one of the boys gets eaten, and the sharks are killing people, and I don't know how to paint a more vivid picture than that. A bunch of the characters end up next to a stopped roller coaster, and a shark goes back and forth, slowly gathering steam along the track to eventually go up and bite somebody, and then Finn gets trapped in the coaster because this movie is stupid, but at the same time, it's also dumb. <laughs> Eventually, everybody is reunited and it feels pretty good. Gloria! I think there are probably some more cameos at this point, but I'm not particularly well versed on QAnon followers and convicted sex offenders, so I don't recognize any of them. The gathering storm worsens, so they go to hide in the Universal Orlando Resort glow, but of course it breaks off and flies around. Thankfully, the most lasting consequence of this is Bo Derek bumps her head off screen, maybe. Yeah, I just got dizzy with all the tumbling. They get out of the thing and decide the only way to stop these ever-increasing Sharknadoes, which have sort of coalesced into a wall of storms, is to create a tower of flames 60 miles high, burning at temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. Pretty sure that would still be pretty bad for Earth, but it's definitely a thing that you could say, so might as well say it. They decide the only people who could really help them build a sun wall is NASA. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. So naturally, they steal a bunch of random NASCAR cars and head to a diner to talk to David Hasselhoff, who was moments prior speaking with Penn and Teller. <sighs> Nova and Finn walk in, and it's pretty apparent that Nova couldn't find a leather jacket able to contain her massive bosoms. Thoughts and prayers, leather jacket. Apparently, Hasselhoff is actually Finn's dad, and he was once an astronaut. But one of those sad shitty ones who never actually got to go into space just had to learn math for nothing. Don't believe everything you hear. They need his help to contact NASA and commission a secret shuttle, beating Fast and Furious to the punch by several years. That's the only difference. What? To me, it sounds like a lot of Sharknado haboo. But they convince him to help, and they head to NASA, which has apparently been just massacred by budget cuts. The place looks less high-tech than my college dorm common area. How about that? Finn puts on a spacesuit so sh** as to be insulting. Like, I know the joke is that these movies are bad, but this is just lazy. I just pretend to try. It's a lot more fun when it's played serious. Not open for discussion. For example, this guy who accidentally bumps into a shotgun bayonet in a clearly unscripted way. Perfection. I guess we should back up now and mention how we've clearly got one of those Armageddon scenarios where it'd be easier to send some dick with a chainsaw into space than give a trained astronaut a chainsaw. I asked Michael why it was easier to train oil drillers to become astronauts than it was to train astronauts to become oil drillers, and he told me to shut, shut, shut the f up. That's not sarcasm, that's a fact. I am terrible with chainsaws. That made more sense when I had an astronaut helmet, but I forgot the prop. Damn it! Also, let's pause a minute to peruse Wikipedia and try to remember what exactly the plan here is. Apparently, it's to shoot the shuttle into space and blow up its fuel tanks in the hopes that'll dissipate the storm. I can't imagine the resultant gasoline explosions would be more powerful than the majority of missiles one offends many military friends could presumably fire, but nobody would be flying those in a homemade suit, so nobody wants to watch that. Not to mention, the sharks. Before Finn can board, however, April yells at him a bunch in the launch tunnel or the drawbridge or whatever. I'm not going to Wikipedia this part. So she decides to come along too. On the ground, the National Guard is deployed to shoot sharks before they hit the shuttle, I guess, and the plan works great. <laughs> Nova hops in a fighter jet, and I am losing track of the plot again. She's clearing the path. Oh, okay, she shoots a hole in the Sharknado so they can get through with the shuttle. Obviously. Yep. Also, real quick, Finn's daughter and her new boyfriend went out to shoot sharks because she, much like our Lord Jesus Christ, says... I'm a shepherd! Unfortunately, her boyfriend... Not so much. So, now they're in space or whatever, and they release some fuel tanks and shit, but it doesn't defeat the storm primarily because why would it? Also, whatever happened to the wall of fire hotter than the sun plan? Fortunately, Hassel Dad worked on the Star Wars program and has an inexplicably accented friend that'll let him shoot a laser at the storm. Which is not surprising. Of course, the satellite needs to be restarted manually, so Hassel Dad finally gets to get out there in space and press some buttons and ultimately, yes, fire the laser at work. Begin 
Laser. Ignition sequence. They don't have enough fuel to get Hasseldad and re-enter Earth's atmosphere, but they don't have to make that decision anyway because they're attacked by- Sharks in space! Finn fights a few with a lightsaber chainsaw, and, and I wish that these theoretically cool moments weren't so freaking boring. <laughs> Anyway, April gets swallowed by a shark, so Finn dives after her. He can't immediately find her, so instead the shark gets used as a... like a makeshift rocket, I guess, and they use it to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. And in case you're worried about the realism here, Finn punches a hole in the shark and releases a parachute, so it's not like they just slam it to the ground, okay? It's important to remember that shark skin is as durable as the outer hull of a space shuttle when it comes to re-entering the atmosphere, but also only about as impenetrable as a watermelon when it comes to punching through it. This is not hypothetical. Finn gets out of the shark, and then April cuts her own hole in the shark and pushes a goddamned baby through the skin. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna lie, that got me. Very surprising, well played Sharknado 3. That's your best idea since boobs. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. Then April herself pushes through the thing, and they name the baby Gil, because we're back to our regular stupid sh**. Oh, Hasseldad ended up on the moon, by the way, and April gets smashed by flying debris. No! Or does she? Keep watching to find out. The storm is changing. It's no longer a beer NATO, it's now an IPA NATO. How is that different? It's kind of pretentious and tastes like sh. Oh yeah, wow, gross. Oh, this one is presented by Sci-Fi. Look out everybody, we're watching a presentation here. Fancy. Even fancier? The movie opens with a Star Wars parody crawl because that's kind of a joke. And the way that telling the Starbucks barista your name is Han Solo is kind of a joke. <laughs> Anyway, it's been five years since the last movie, and a SpaceX parody company called Astro X has found a way to stop all tornadoes and presumably run a Twitter parody into the ground. Sorry? But whatever. Apparently, they also saved Hasseldad from the moon because, let's be honest, he's easily the most charismatic actor in this cursed franchise. What? This nonsense is all in service of announcing that Astro X founder Aston Reynolds is opening a shark hotel. It even has a Sharknado game in it. Building the theme around the most devastating and horrifying events in American history feels somewhat equivalent to opening a bakery run by the ghost of Hitler that has a pinball machine based on your parents' divorce. What does that equal? 360, 24, 7, 5. A reporter has the same question for Aston as me, but he definitely avoids giving a direct answer. This guy should be a president. Bam! Smash cut to little Gil, who we last saw as a weird, slimy, bloody blob, but who is now a weird, probably still slimy five-year-old who says weird things like that his mom is a shark. It's mommy! Granted, it did appear to the viewer like he was an emergency C-section baby from a shark, but unless this kid watched Sharknado 3, where would he even get that idea? What is his dad telling him? Don't worry about that. Speaking of, daddy is nearby, just living the simple life of chopping wood and carrying his young son pressed against his ass. <laughs> but all good things must end, and Finn's sexy niece, Jim and I, shows up to take Finn to the opening of this Las Vegas shark hotel to ostensibly meet up with Finn's son, Matt, who's currently on military leave. Then Daddy says to Jim and I, I, I think let's get greasy, which is, I mean, I at least hope a crime. So I may get... A little crazy. So now they're in Las Vegas, experiencing the absolute worst the city has to offer, namely a fully on carrot top. Drop and give me forty. Keep your eyes on the road. Jim and I pulls a not another teen movie. It gets even hotter if such a thing is possible. I mean, God, she and Daddy have some unsettlingly sexy chemistry. Is that a problem with the way I look? But hottest of all, they run into a Chippendales beefcake. And also, there are probably a lot of cameos in the casino that I don't recognize, 
nor care to Google. Blow. If I wanted to look at a bunch of old sad failures, I just tape 10 photos of Dave to my windshield. Or just go like this. Some good pictures. Matt hasn't shown up just yet because he's getting skydive married, which I guess is a fun, sexy, spontaneous thing to do, but his dad isn't even aware his son is engaged, which suggests they're still not very close, which is sad in a, I don't actually care about these characters, but I'm personally a dad, and this situation in real life would make me sad in real life kind of way. Is this a sad commentary on how surviving horrifying death sometimes isn't enough to bond people? Or is this just a stupid movie? Literally impossible to tell. I know what you're thinking, but we haven't had a NATO in five years. Whoa, I've traveled back in time to say, speaking of not being close, Matt's appearance appears drastically changed by his stint in the army because war, like watching all the Sharknado movies, is hell. It'll be a wonder if daddy even recognizes him. You know, a lot of people don't think I can win an Oscar for a YouTube video, but uh, this is gonna prove them wrong. Have I heard the movie mention that April is dead yet? No? Well, she is. Maybe. We now learn that the way Astro X defeats tornadoes is with things called astropods, which just sort of shoot out a shockwave that nullifies the tornado with the magic of science. <laughs> Except, well, that bullshit science is no match for any sort of tornado that picks up any sort of debris besides sharks. Like, for example, if some sand gets in a tornado, then the population of America will make like Scarlett O'Hara and be gone with the wind. This exact type of storm arrives and gets worse and worse until Matt and wife get sucked exactly the opposite of how they were hoping. Ah! Also, all the damn sharks get sucked out of the hotel and attack people, but not penises. That's their weakness. Forget astropods, let's create a penis NATO. Hey Dave, let's make a penis NATO. Dave, 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 let's make a penis NATO. Maybe after the shoot, Dave. Dave, can we make a penis NATO? Oh, and here's a clumsy product placement for you in case that's what you were hoping for from your dumbass shark movie. We just had the Affinity X1 installed. And once again, the Today Show, but sans Matt Lauer. He must have been too busy molesting something. Astro X should probably make a Matt Lauer hotel. Matt Lauer and Jared Fogel's sleep palace does have a nice ring to it. Jackpot! Then and Jim and I spring into action to save some people, including a bit where a car literally lands on the hotel and Finn pulls Matt's wife into it for safety because somebody wrote this scene on the back of an Arby's napkin, so now it's in the movie even if it's neither cool nor interesting. The car falls off the roof, but they don't die because they surf the car. Oh, okay. That was their convoluted way of trying to make this a cool moment. Feels like it would have been cooler to drive a showcase car off the roof like in Fast 7 and then surf it to the ground, but having it randomly land on the building and awkwardly like fall off is also possible. We need to get out of this car. Why? They land on the ground just fine and Gemini parachutes off the roof because it's relatively quick and the hotel explodes. <laughs> throwing sharks and water everywhere, almost exactly like the time I cannonballed an aquarium exhibit. This forces them to commandeer what I assume is a decommissioned pirate ship and sail around while also literally sword fighting sharks in the hopes of catching a still falling, still getting sucked mat. Okay, this brings up a thing again. As I said, they do grab swords and they do stab some sharks, but in general, these movies are at the point where it's pretty clear a handful of dudes get drunk one night and throw every stupid idea they have on a whiteboard and then cram as many of those scribblings into the movie as they can. They don't develop the idea or find a way to make it actually compelling. They just sort of yell, SWORD FIGHT SHARKS AT A PIRATE SHIP! And then they show that thing happening for 10 to 15 seconds so viewers can honestly tell their friends the guy from Beverly Hills 90210 had a sword fight with a shark and their friend can say, I don't know you. Get away from me. When was the last time you took a shower? And the Sharknado stand can yell, THERE'S A CHAINSAW MADE OF LIGHTSABER! Well, the cops drag them away. Speaking of, they load fireworks into a cannon to shoot into the storm while Matt falls off a building. As one might expect, he lands on the boat, does a quip, and gets a kiss before somebody yells, SHARK BURG! Because again, the whiteboard. Ah! Now, these movies have always looked terrible, but is it just me or does this shot give off serious kid show vibes? Feels like that Dora the Explorer parody. Swiper, you old f 
The NATO goes off into the desert to gather the necessary elements for a lizard or cactus NATO joke, and we cut to a comic book stylized intro sequence, and I'm calling it right now. This NATO will be nuclear by the end of this movie, or I will suck Dave into this beer NATO outside. Hey, look at this idiot kid. I'm a big bad shark, fish. Also, Aston's anime stock footage gen. He mentioned something about the mech program because let me check. Yeah, it's on the whiteboard. What is it on the whiteboard? Can the whiteboard predict my death from watching all these damned movies? Canceling. Now we're at Astro X and David Hasseldad is wearing apparently not the mech suit because it's a jetpack, I guess. <laughs> Also, Gary Busey, as a scientist, is on Zoom, and fortunately for my eyes, the hot daughter is back. <laughs> Even though she doesn't know the difference between Gene Roddenberry's Star Wars and George Lucas's Star Trek. Star Trek, not Star Wars. <laughs> But speaking of hot women with thin characterization, I guess Aston has hired two to follow him around. Looks like I've got a new Patreon stretch goal, kids. <laughs> if I make $6,000, two hot women will follow me around. <laughs> And we all win! Okay, here's where the movie says April died. Sorry I wasn't there for mom's funeral. Immediately followed by where the movie says no April didn't die. <laughs> this movie is twistier than well, I mean, you know. Shark Apparently, Gary Busey is both April's dad and a scientist that's turned April into an android or something, as evidenced by this cord she plugs into herself and these artificially sped up punches. <laughs> oh, and the fact that when she says, turn on the force, her hand turns into a lightsaber, which... Turn on the force. <laughs> I mean, come on, that makes no sense. Turning on the force should do something with telekinesis or making out with your sister. This has nothing to do with me. Not turning on a lightsaber. I know this movie is shit, but this is the sci-fi channel. Surely they want to maintain some shred of credibility, right? Whatever, I guess nobody besides April, her dad, and this random Jack dude know she's alive yet, so here's hoping she randomly shows up on a fire truck at just the right moment later on. Oh, and look at that. April apparently thought Finn was dead, but now she knows the truth. So she punches the door and goes to find him against her Busey's wishes. You stay in here! <laughs> ah! How naive we were when we thought this shit would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> her family rides a train back to Kansas, but as with most things, it's not quite that simple. They're being followed by a dust NATO that destroys the Hoover Dam, which inspires Aston to blow up the Grand Canyon to create a new makeshift dam and help regain the company's lost trust of greater American people. Yeah. I won't speak to whether that makes sense because I don't know and also I don't care because oh shit, it's now a tornado with boulders and I believe shark more dangerous but how? Even Finn seems unimpressed by this escalation. They managed to stop the train and that is what it takes to escape the NATO because it works on the exact opposite of Prometheus rules. Aston and Finn argue a bit because Aston wants to recruit Finn to give a speech where he assures everybody they'll be fine, but he keeps saying no. Back to your world. But it's not like there's anybody trying to stop or hurt Astro X. As far as I can tell, the entire government collapsed in the last movie. <laughs> So they're operating pretty much unilaterally. Remember that time they blew up the Grand Canyon with no consequences? We have to blow up the Grand Canyon. You blew up the Grand Canyon. I stopped the flood. Why worry about public perception? Just stop the damn tornadoes. Stop arguing with Finn. I'm proud to be joining the Today Show. Rest in peace, Godfrey. It's a tornado! Never mind. There's a tornado made of cows! How many of these have I had? So with the train out of commission, Finn and his little troop drive together in a car to further escape the tornado that I guess was just taking a break, but is now back. Fortunately, Finn isn't driving fast enough, so his son Matt reminds him, I drove combat, which almost certainly doesn't apply in this situation, but good to know he used to have a purpose. If I can get you licking and loving, 
I have my purpose. But anyway, he drives well enough for them to end up at a literal chainsaw store full of, I assume, cameos, while outside a tornado hits an oil field and becomes a tornado. Because nature evolves Pokemon style from sand to boulder to fire and ultimately nuclear, mark my words, zip your pants back up, Dave, no sucking yet. Because of this, they naturally run outside to find a line of fire extinguishers just sitting on the ground and a chainsaw bulldozer, a chain dozer. Sweet. An idea from the whiteboard that we see kill like maybe three sharks. But then Finn equips a grenade launcher from his weapon wheel, I guess, and kills the tornado with it. Sometimes tornadoes require tons of explosives, and sometimes it's just like one grenade. Back at Astro X, Aston and his team, and also, I guess, the sexy women standing behind him, determine they need to use different isotopes or something to defeat all the different elements the tornadoes are picking up. Obviously, they just needed to say something here that sounds like science, and they did. Okay, I like that, Terry. You can handle that, right? My God. God, they did. We can infuse more isotopes into the base. Okay. They need to say science words fast too, because tornadoes are clearly just landing wherever the hell now, including right on top of Hassle Dad and Hot Daughter making a hot NATO. <gasps> Woo! -hoo! Keep your head down and get in the car. Speaking of hot messes, April finally shows up and literally catches her hot daughter and hot father-in-law's car out of the air. So there's a bit of uniting here. It feels fine. You're both alive. Also, all those cyborg parts did not make April look like she knew how to run for sh**. What did Busey spend all this time doing inside his daughter if not helping her look good? I just realized this is Torpedo IPA and I kept thinking this is what I wanted. Yeah. But that's not a tornado. <laughs> I kept thinking, yeah, torpedo, like a, like the movie. Like the, like the movie. There's no torpedoes in the movie. Torpedo. I was like, yeah, torpedo. I do love that you just realized this <laughs> right now. Well, I bought it, I brought it here, I started drinking it, and just in this moment, I'm like, ah, oh, Meanwhile, Finn has car troubles of his own and a tire goes flat, so we get a truly inexplicable cameo of the evil car from the movie Christine. Christine. That's a cameo that I get, but truly do not understand. It's unfortunately not evil here, but if it was, I would have been right back on board, baby. There's also a cameo of some other dude that I don't get and who isn't a malevolent vehicle, so I don't care to Google him. He mentions a spider infestation, which sure sounds like a clue to either his identity or a spin-off franchise. Probably the Lava Lava Lanchula? Lava Lanchula movies? Tarantula. If you tried to smash lava and tarantula. What does that say to you? But I refuse to watch them, even for this video, even for my own channel. I regret this video already. <laughs> anyway, they drive the apparently rehabilitated car to Finn's farm, but not before encountering a big ball of twine, <laughs> and also sharks, and also a really good actor. Help! Help! And I think this is a joke somehow. I mean, everything is a joke, but I think this is supposed to be some specific joke, but I, I have no idea what it is. Twine is stupid, a, a poor export. <laughs> I, I don't know. Now they're finally back at Finn's farm and there's like a cow NATO fused with a lightning NATO, which logically should result in a burger brisket NATO, but doesn't because these movies hate science. But fortunately, even though Nova is in Paris, she apparently left a ton of guns behind. Thank you, Nova. And also a crossbow and also a chainsaw sword. Kind of confused how these are Nova's weapons that Finn wasn't sure were there when, is it this Finn's farm? No, oh, no, I'm thinking too hard. Thank you, Nova. But not as hard as his shark chomps on Matt's wife's arm. She eventually dies, in part, because she shoots at every shark in the sky before the one that's actively eating her. <laughs> Prioritization is important. <laughs> oh, and, oh no! Now, Finn and everybody else are getting sucked real good, so they run into the house, which kicks off a thrilling 10-minute sequence, where Finn tries very slowly to grab Gil. Hold on! Hold on! Hold on, son! Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! 
And despite all the things that happened in this movie, I think this is where the editor realized they were not going to hit 90 minutes unless they added a bunch of footage in this very specific scene. Animal! He's just out here like, I'm coming, Gil. The movie's only at 80 minutes, but if we just keep coming for Gil. Apparently the house is also picked up by the NATO and brought to Chicago, like the world's shittiest up sequel. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's an insane Chicago mayor played by insane CSI actor Stacey Dash who decides Finn is actively causing Sharknado somehow, but don't worry, she gets Wicked Witched of the East pretty quick. The Wicked Witch of the East, bro! <laughs> so, just like, file that away somewhere. Are you okay? She, she wore a clown and she came down in a ball game, <laughs> dog! April and Hasseldad are flying around in an Astro X airplane now, and somebody mentions that somehow they've located Finn even though he's getting sucked on a farm fairly far off the grid. And so they immediately reroute the plane, presumably land somewhere, and grab Finn from under the table he was hiding under when they located him in the first place from the plane. So like, all in the span of maybe three minutes. Buckle up. What is this? Game of Thrones season seven? Got him! So now they're all on the plane, and Finn and April share a tender moment, particularly when she reveals that her daddy gave her brand new titty. <laughs> Uh, oh no, <laughs> she's revealing that she's an android. Finn thought she was dead because she was in a coma for like four years and he actively pulled her off life support, but then I guess Gary Busey stole her body and rebuilt her, tits and all. He kept me alive. April also mentions that she doesn't know how long she'll live because the technology that's powering her body is so untested and also presumably because contract negotiations for future movies are ongoing. As long as you have a beating heart, I'm gonna Gil, unfortunately, refuses to accept April as his mom because My mother is a shark, not a robot. And it is hard to argue with that. I used to say that to my mom all the time when I was a kid. It's John Cena! Wait, Aston is on this plane too? How? I, where is the government? The movie now mostly only hangs on each story for like 15 seconds at a time, so I'm just gonna real quick list a bunch of places that get hit by various themed NATOs, including Salt Lake Comic Con, St. Louis Arch, the Chicago Bean, Mount Rushmore, Seattle. Yeah! Philadelphia gets hit, but they entirely miss the opportunity to create a cheese steak NATO, or a battery sock NATO, or even a Nick Foles NATO. These are all just off the top of my Superdome, guys. Ugh. Okay, so now I'm gonna say some words that may or may not make sense. One of the NATOs has gone nuclear, see? And they determined the only way to stop it is going to be to cool the NATO, which is basically the same plot as the second movie, but this time instead of blowing up coolant tanks on top of the Empire State Building, they have to redirect Niagara Falls into the tornado. And doing this requires the use of a quantum box. We just need a body of water and a quantum box? Which is what Robo April probably calls her cyber vagina. <laughs> oh, but no, it's not that. She's got it where it counts. To power this quantum box, they'll need to use a battery that's compatible with a mech suit that Astro X has built for Hassle Dad. And if all of those things happen, the movie will mercifully end. Yeah! To that end, Aston jumps out of the plane for some reason and also yells, and makes weird howls because that kid's is both funny and silly. <laughs> Look at how silly this movie is. Love us! Now you know how I feel. Aston lands and attempts to activate the quantum box, which I won't even bother to explain, but he falls off the ledge and dies a sad failure. <laughs> just like I certainly will after I finish editing this video that nobody will watch long enough to even get to this part and and like Dave already is and always has been. There's gonna be like three people who are like, I got to that part. <laughs> Shout out to my three Patreon supporters, Dave, his mom, and me under an alias. Yeah! But whatever, next the entire family decides they're gonna go down there and do something to help install a second mech suit, engine battery, or whatever that they just apparently had lying around. Wait, there's another quantum box. <laughs> Repeating a theme from the last movie, Hasseldad offers to sacrifice himself to do the whatever with the whatever, and he dons the mech suit, but is almost immediately killed. <laughs> Though not before a brief encounter with what I have to assume are two of his old Baywatch co-stars. I love being on the beach. Even worse, the hot daughter is eaten. 
So Finn now dons the mech suit and I'm still honestly not sure the plan or how it works or I'm forcing myself to keep watching. And if this ends up being the first video, like I think it will, it's probably not even monetized. Like I'm not even making money right now. I'm just, I'm just here. I'm losing money. I bought a f***ing torpedo IPA that I thought was a tornado IPA. That's not cheap, these shitty craft beers. There's literally no point to this. And hey, speaking of, of that, they shove Gil in a barrel because Niagara Falls. No! And then April starts flying around and shooting lasers out of her hands because whiteboard. And then Matt is eaten. And if they don't end up reversing time somehow, then what is even the point of my life? <laughs> Finn eventually arrives at the box and just sort of gets electrocuted by the box and screams and that somehow turns it into a cool NATO. But that's still pretty dangerous and Gil's barrel gets sucked into the storm and then it gets plopped in the water. But it's cool because April saves him, but it's not cool because Finn gets eaten by Russian nesting sh sharks and also a whale like a turducken, but with sharks and whales. And then Gil pulls a chainsaw from a rock like a kid in King Arthur's ass and uses it to cut into the whale and pull out his dad mimicking his own birth and symbolically now making him his dad's dad and presumably inspiring the end of Alex Garland's men, but it doesn't stop there because he also pulls out every other previously eaten character, which is significantly less awesome than my time travel idea. Oh, also the astropods fire and the tornado dissipates. <laughs> The movie ends with Finn unconscious, so they try CPR, but he still has no pulse, so they grab a couple sharks and connect them to April's battery whatever and use them as defibrillators against the backdrop of what appears to be an entirely green screened park. I don't know, what do you want me to say? Then we get a real fancy ending Finn. Oh, apparently the Slipknot dude was in this. We also get an end credit scene that shows the Eiffel Tower crashing with Nova on top. So be excited about that. The NATO has gone international. Now it's fancy. <laughs> I sure hope this is instead. <laughs> Back home, we're trying to make America great again. Another NATO, another catastrophe pun, another force nod to conservatism. Yep. And another opening featuring a weird riff on a popular movie franchise. This time, it's Indiana Jones. And at least this time, the actual movie itself thematically follows the opening joke by opening with Nova in an actual cave, observing symbols and shit. There's also a Mad Magazine reference here, which like, fuck you, man! Crack forever, baby! Let's go! Thank you, Mad Magazine. Nova's not entirely alone, as there are a few other sexy ladies nearby, one of whom speaks Spanish for no reason. And Nova decides she needs Finn Shepard before venturing any further into the cave. And I tell you what, there's nobody I'd rather have uh, spelunking me in my cave than Finn Shepard. <laughs> Cut to my spelunked fantasy boy with April and Gil hanging out in London with the ghost of Chris Catan doing the most British accent possible. <laughs> yes. Apparently NATO, more like shark na- Ah, oh, shit. That was like the first joke I made. Whatever. NATO wants to discuss options with Finn as Europe deals with its own series of shark attacks. But before that happens, Nova calls... Well, not Finn, technically, for some reason, but she does want to talk to Finn, so he talks to her, and she's like, you gotta get out here, and he's like, okay. So he helicopters to her at Stonehenge, because Stonehenge is the only thing in Europe that movies feel like will accept as ancient and exotic. <laughs> I mean, it's either that, or trying to sell us on the ancient origins of the Gatherer of Vittorio Emmanuel McDonald's. It's reiterated that Nova did in fact ride across the entire Atlantic Ocean on the Eiffel Tower, only to have to like fly coach back to Ireland, I guess. I thought Nova retired after she rode the Eiffel Tower across the Atlantic. Oh, that woman who spoke Spanish also speaks English, so there was no reason for her to speak Spanish. Be careful, Mrs. Chapel. Finn, then Tom cruises his way into the cave and then makes fun of Tom Cruise, presumably because the man is categorically the opposite of everything this movie 
movie franchise stands for. Shut the f*** up and let me do my job! Then, the movie hints at an upcoming Fast and Furious crossover. This isn't about sharks. It's about John Cena! Nova reveals that these shark attacks have happened before in history and that there's a shark god, a shod, I guess, and they need some kind of harness to defeat the shark natives like their ancestors once did. It's called the Harness of Dukawaka. Thankfully, Nova has planned for just this situation by building up a sort of cult of shark nato sisters, which is basically just a bunch of sexy leather clad women who look like Victoria's Secret models and hate sharks almost as much as carbs. Now we know what Victoria's Secret was. She and her friends used to hunt shark deities. Can you keep a secret? And here I was, thinking she ran over a hobo while in college. The writing's on the wall. Then we get a really involved Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant opening scene riff that goes on for a lot longer than you'd expect and which culminates with them grabbing the MacGuffin they need and also inadvertently destroying Stonehenge. Now they claim the harness or whatever was put there by druids, but if it's supposed to be a key weapon in the fight against sharks, why would they hide it. And why would they make it so difficult to obtain? <laughs> That's like if you were having a heart attack and the only way the EMT could access the shark defibrillators is if they journey to the center of the earth and defeat a minotaur. By the time you actually need the thing, you don't really have time to answer multiple series of riddles three. You want the baby boys whole, you gotta pay the troll to- Whatever, the Spanish speaker dies. <laughs> Stock purple lightning shoots out of Stonehenge before the movie pivots back to London for some light James Bond riffs. You know, for the kids. April and Gil meet up with a Q analog, uh, like from the from James Bond, not from the 8chan troll destroying democracy. Uh, yes. And he's like, look, I've got gadgets and shit including a shark hat that will inexplicably, unbelievably be a key factor in the plot of the entire movie. Apparently, the hat makes sharks think that the wearer is in fact a shark and somehow protects him from being ripped apart in a tornado. So just know that. This might be booby. Cut to an apparently real Today-like show called Good Morning Britain that mentions... <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, a shark NATO has made... <laughs> Landfall. <laughs> uh, Q and his woman are apparently excited about this apocalyptic development. I would have some fun. Finn's return helicopter is attacked by sharks, but it's fine because April is again able to catch the damned thing out of the air and then she just hucks it away. <laughs> They run into town and Nova pulls an April from the second movie by inexplicably showing up out of nowhere driving a vehicle. In this instance, it's a double-decker bus, but not just any double-decker bus because this one has run into Brett Michaels and he sticks to the front and plays unplugged electric guitar like the post-apocalypse's lamest, shittiest war boy. Shark kick. The bus crashes, and I feel like it's important to note that Finn picked up a whip in the cave that he's still carrying around, but has yet to actually use. Then they all have collective deja vu, watching a detached Ferris wheel roll around, just like in the first movie. It's all connected, like a bunch of sharks sucking their own dicks in a tornado. Like a shark sucks a pedonata or a burros, if you, ooh. Dave, I got a great idea for uh, something we could do after the shoot. Do sharks have dicks? How do they make more sharks if they don't have dicks, Dave? Yeah, I mean, like, they yeah. They swim around. you never seen shark nuts? No, Dave, when they get excited, they open up the... the, the Cloaca. And it... I am demonetized probably at this point. This is a shark dick channel now! Like YouTube is gonna comb through this whole video looking for shark dicks. Oh! I found one! Elsewhere, Chris Catan pulls out a secret briefcase in an attempt to initiate Skyfall, and then the London Bridge literally falls down. London Bridge is falling down! Which are hilarious references to both the last good James Bond movie and, I assume, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, respectively. Speaking of dying things, the Queen is apparently trapped in Buckingham Palace, and the fear is that if she dies, the entire British Empire will be sad. But I know from experience there are wide swaths of that empire that won't be that upset about it. Another one bites the dust. Regardless, Finn rallies the stupid royal guard and charges some sharks while his dumbass son impales a dumbass shark with his dumbass helmet before getting sucked into a dumbass tornado. 
damn, there's like no liquid in here and it keeps falling on my pants. <laughs> Finn, for his part, literally rides a shark into the palace and runs into the queen, who is clearly a cameo I don't recognize, but I'm sure is either very funny or very poignant or very something else depending on who it is. Let me know in the comments how this moment moves you. Very important for engagement algorithm click to rate SEO. Cheers. <laughs> oh, and now it's the title cards, but with like a postcard theme or like a manga anime theme or maybe none of the above, I don't know. But now it's over. Nova's got a lock on Gil and is constantly spinning ass with her iPhone or whatever that's tracking his dumbass helmet. But no time for that. They need to go to a NATO meeting so Finn can give a speech that'll somehow defeat the sharks. In a series where basically every problem is solved with a chainsaw, it's weird how adamant it is that the most important thing is dramatic speeches. Now back home, we're trying to make America great again. <laughs> oh. Does this make the sharks a metaphor for liberals? Or maybe just people that drink lattes and or dye their hair? Do sharks like watching their wives have sex with other people? Hey, speaking of liberals, sharks kill everybody. <laughs> so now they need a new plan and a way to chase Gil Storm and they decide to ride on a blimp owned by an eccentric steampunk billionaire. Shockingly, this is actually not a must cameo. <laughs> And once again, despite this being a surprisingly elaborate setup, the whole trip takes about five minutes of runtime because again, the whiteboard is undefeated. The billionaire is immediately eaten and the blimp Hindenburgs and they just start s sledding in Switzerland. It's honestly about as cool as the nearly identical Spectre scene. The sled stops and ski equipment Machina's right in front of them so Finn does a, a little hop. And April attempts to pull the tornado back towards them by spinning real quick in a circle while holding a ski. This is another moment it seems like I should make fun of, but that just makes me the ass right? She's like Wonder Woman. I don't know. April's limp scream creates an avalanche, forcing them to do some skiing and snowboarding while a random cameo kills a shark with an ice skate. Then everybody sort of crashes and I spilled more. There's not even any in here. It's like, it's like just creating more liquid to spill on my pants. And for no reason at all, let's cut to freaking Matt, who's pimping out his grandmother to this creepy old man. What can I say, man? She's smoking hot. And we're back. And of course, our snowbound friends find some sled dogs that they use to chase the tornado. But at this point, what's the plan if they catch it? Flash! But apparently, yes, that is the plan. And they hop in the tornado, except, oops, there's like a wormhole in there or some sh and they get sent to Australia. And that, my friends, is how we'll fulfill the global part of the promise that is this movie's title. How the hell do we get to Australia? They get picked up by a helicopter piloted by a terrible Australian accent because I guess there are no actual Australians. They could have tapped for a cameo. We're gonna toss down a road. And Nova claims that she forgot sharks existed in the waters near Australia. Or maybe she's saying that she forgot sharks originate in Australia? Do they? I forgot they come. We don't have time to Snopes it though because April shoots some lasers and we hard cut to the Today Show, but like the Australian version. You're gonna wanna hold on to your budgie smugglers. I guess these are all NBC affiliate shows that the channel is hoping to promote for some godforsaken reason. Or maybe it's just to make all their anchors seem more likable and less Matt Lauer. You'd better run. I don't know, but anyway, April got chopped up in the water and is carried around like C-3PO on Finn's hairy back. I backward. Fortunately, Nova Sharknado sisters have an Australian branch underneath the Sydney Opera House, which obviously doubles as a battle station, and the sisters are able to rebuild April into some sort of lunatic sex Barbie. It's also revealed Gemini is and has always been a sister, and she's currently off the coast of China trying to dispose of some nuclear waste for not all that clear reasons, but her attempts result in another nuclear NATO that actually turns into a weird radioactive ball of sharks and attacks Okinawa before attacking the mainland in a way that just sort of feels racist, but we'll come back to that in a long time. 
You know how much I love playing with your balls. The Gemini reveal really pisses off Finn, and he and Nova get into an argument about whether to prioritize family or ending the threat of Sharknados, which Nova clearly wins because the one helps the other. Is that so? And besides, Gil's been stuck in a Sharknado for like a week at this point, and he's doing just fine. There's no rush. But anyway, a Sharknado is impending, so April sneakily pickpockets the harness thing from Nova, and the sisters call in their most valuable asset. Call in the Hulk. Tony Hawk. He's apparently the only person that can get on top of the opera house and activate the lasers, which I can confirm as a veteran of Tony Hawk Underground 2. These guys suck. But it does feel like maybe they should have a, an easier way to activate the lasers. Like what if Tony Hawk is busy? Man was not made to do this. Back inside, Finn says what I always say when I've spoken to somebody earlier in the day in a way that I regret. I'm sorry for the way I spoke to you earlier. And he and April bungee jump into the tornado to get Gil while the opera house fires its laser. It doesn't work, of course, and they're blasted to Brazil. Now, I'm sure it'd be tough to communicate to Gil, but if he removed his helmet, could he also just get transported safely to some foreign country so that he too could experience a wacky adventure in an exotic locale? Seems like it'd save everybody a lot of trouble and, you know, give the opportunity for the Zimbabwe branch of the Today Show to get some airtime. Whatever. Finn goes to a bar and some gregarious American says to follow him while some suspicious man who looks suspiciously like the most interesting man in the world follows them. Suspiciously. Finn gets dropped off at a church to meet some random hot lady named Vega who explains that he needs to return the damn harness stone to Stonehenge or the world will end. But like, the stone has already been at Stonehenge for four straight movies and the world has actively been ending the entire time. She also explains that the point of the stone is to summon Sharknados at will, which why would you want that? Apparently there is some value because some dude steals the stone so he can Summon a Sharknado of his own, I guess? But to what end? Maybe he's related to the shark fin dealers from the first movie and he wants revenge or more shark fins? It's all connected. Just a bunch of Dave sucking their own dicks, baby. I mean, sharks. Do it fast. But then they chase him until the dude gets sucked into a tornado despite theoretically being able to control them now? Is this what he wants? What is even happening right now? Well, I'll tell you, Dave, their car is now sucked into the tornado and is being carried by Jesus. Jesus, it's you. Side note, the actors have clearly been instructed to underact during climactic moments, but I think it'd be funnier for them to overreact, personally. Just a note, in case the director of these movies watches my personal YouTube channel. Join my Patreon, man. Ha! <laughs> Guilt! No! Ugh. Now they're thrown to Italy, and they continue chasing the dude. They drive a smart car, while he drives a car with an absolutely villain amount of headlights. Eventually they catch up to him, and April suggests that Finn... Kick his ass! And Finn finally uses his Chekhov's whip. At some point, a shark eats the stone, but they cut it open, so it's fine. But okay, yeah, the villain is defeated, so they chase the NATO, but before they can get to it, Finn says what I say whenever I try to eat Taco Bell at 4 a.m. Damn it, it closed! April brilliantly throws some coins in a wishing well, because mm. that's as good a plan as they have, besides, you know, using the stone that summons shark NATOs, obviously. When in Rome? Yes. <laughs> Please go on. But I guess it works in the sense that shortly after, a random woman shows up and sets up a meeting with the literal Pope who hands Finn a gnarly uh, chainsaw because apparently that's what your indulgences have bought, Catholics. <laughs> then Finn drops a Hamilton reference. I'm not throwing away my sh which is sure to piss off the conservatives who to this point been thrilled there's finally a movie series just for them. What's going on? But okay, April and Finn finally use the stone for its literal only purpose and they say what I assume is the tagline for this entire series. Clear your mind of all thoughts. They summon a Sharknado and Finn hops inside and shoots lasers out of his chainsaw by pushing the Jesus button as one does. That was easy. But then April gets sucked up. <laughs> and they 
once again get transported somewhere else. This time, it's Tokyo of earlier fame. And I'm sure they're known for something else too. Konnichiwa! Konnichiwa! <laughs> the blob has sort of coalesced into a... Shabzilla. But before we get to that, have you considered downloading the Xfinity streaming app? Let's see what I could find on the Xfinity stream app. And speaking of the racism I alluded to earlier, I'm not really feeling this scene where a Japanese lady throws a literal Pokeball. I just, I don't know guys, I know Dave likes making fun of different cultures in a way that makes them seem inferior, but I'm more hesitant. That's how you do it. One down, 5,000 more to go. Level up. I mean, for example, Dave, how do you feel about this joke about a shark NATO in Africa being called a circle of life safari NATO? It's a safari NATO! I bet you love it, you dick. I hope a shark sucks you to death. And now Nova enters the chat, dressed up like Wonder Woman. Not sure how that'll help anything other than make America bait again. Slice, dice, and mutilate until there's nothing left. But she jumps from a plane, and I guess Gil is currently in the Sharkzilla mask somewhere, which is unfortunate because it's getting blasted by fighter jets. Oh no, look at that. Gil is done. And then Nova does. And the pervy old man you forgot about dies. No! And then Matt dies. No! And if the next movie is about time, isn't about time travel, I will fist fight whatever noodly armed adult Gil eventually grows into inside the Sharknado. Then summons an Ubernado to travel back to Stonehenge and in the process has a weird dream sequence or something. And of course, they actually end up in Egypt. They decide to make like the Sphinx's husband and uh, enter the Sphinx and Finn smashes the harness thing so he can use some small part of it as a key but now it can't be returned to Stonehenge, right? Are there competing secret shark fighting societies that use the same rock but for different purposes? How does Finn know that this is the more correct society? I don't know. But it turns out he's at least somewhat correct as they determine this random machine that they find somehow controls the core of the shark NATO. So they start up the machine, but it of course collapses the pyramids and shoots a big ass pink laser blast that appears to dissipate the storm everywhere, including one by an apparently rebuilt Statue of Liberty, except then the machine starts again, and that's a bad thing. Excuse me, but we just received word that Dusseldorf has been completely wiped off the map by a barrage of Sharknado. Because the storms also start back up and kill Gemini, so Finn shoves a random staff into a thing, which appears to create something, but as far as I can tell, it has literally no effect. What does seem to have an effect is April going Super Saiyan so hard, she dissipates a tsunami. <laughs> But then, she literally completely explodes. Well, except for her head, I guess. And that's really all you need, right, Dave? Dave, right? Especially, I mean, her eyes are still half open, right, Dave? That's all you need, Dave. That's all Dave's ever needed. No! No! Anyway, so apparently the world is full-on post-apocalyptic now, and Finn is possibly the only person alive. But not for long, because a fun V drives up, piloted by... Gil, who has inexplicably aged into Dolph Lundgren. Accent and all. Come on, you gotta trust me, Dad. The passage of time has apparently been rough. Phil says he needs Finn to travel back in time with- Called it! Finn says sure, and the Humvee flies away to be continued. <coughs> with Back to the Future font. Oh, and apparently George, or rather the actor who played George because George is already dead, well, he died. And I don't think I ever said that his name was George. I meant the drunk guy. But this movie is dedicated to him. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, I'd rather have literally anything else dedicated to me. I'd rather Dave dedicate his next taco sh** to me. Please, Dave, if I die, just like pour, pour some out for me on your sh**. Okay, just so you know what's going on, the house is currently traveling through time. What? Yeah, I mean, it's no big deal, but just wanted you to be aware. You should probably hurry up and finish this movie and the beers before we end up somewhere shitty, like 2003. Alright, yeah, whatever. Don't you look at me funny! I ain't stupid! 
And now we find ourselves here, at the end of all things. Also looking at the moon for some reason. Also, also a shark fin shaped rock and dinosaurs and ultimately a weird riff on 2001 A Space Odyssey to prove that actually these screenwriters are smart, okay? They get movies. Anyway, the fin explodes because of a flying f***ing Humvee. <laughs> And while you might think this Humvee houses both Finn Shepard and Dolph Lundgren, you'd be wrong. Because as a hologram of somebody who is definitely not Dolph explains, you can only go back in time once? And not Dolph already did. But hey, at least Dolph showed Finn a good time because he says exactly what Dave's mom always says to me after a beautiful evening together. That's one hell of a ride, son. <laughs> Not Dolph also explains that to travel in time, you gotta hit 88 miles per hour because better movie reference. Well, what if I go back to the future and I end up being gay? Gay. And the reason they've traveled to this time period specifically is because if Finn manages to destroy the first ever Sharknado in history, that should end the phenomenon before it's even begun. I can't believe they gave us Dolph only to take him away before they made a sick ass dolphin joke at Dolph's expense. Go to comedy prison, you hack franchise. You're just gonna take a few liberties with her. Finn gets out of the Humvee and oops, drops his bag of head. Where's the bag? Right into a dino stampede. Ah. One stampeding dino picks up April's head and runs off with it because this is just the sort of wacky hijinks the series has been missing. Finn chases the creature until a bunch of dinos commit just the sort of wacky mass suicide the series has been missing. <laughs> And then a prehistoric mega shark shows up, as well as a T-Rex. Fortunately, Finn still has that Egyptian staff thing from the last movie, and he jumps over the T-Rex and rides its tail like Legolas on an oliphant trunk. I still only count as gay. Then Shark Eat Rex. <laughs> apparently inspiring the ending of one of the worst dress park sequels ever <laughs> because Sharknado is a movie that keeps on giving. Shit. Come on, give it back. It truly is the my cousin who hit his head while dirt biking and has never been the same since of movie franchises. The head dino hasn't killed itself, but it's all good because a bird person jumps off a cliff and stabs it to death because there is so much movie in this movie. Bird person? You appear to be dying. But hey, that bird person? Why, it's Nova, obviously. And whoa, look at that. It's the dude from 30 Rock. And oh my God, it's April riding a flying dinosaur. All my favorite characters are here. Wow. Well, except George. Yeah. Turns out April is no longer a robot because as it turns out, Gil saved everybody from various points in time and April specifically was saved in the third movie before Busey Daddy got all up inside of her. No one will know. This gaggle of weirdos has been living together for a year just waiting for Finn to show up. Why couldn't they all just be sent simultaneously to the moment that Finn arrives? Like just show up a couple of hours before the Sharknado hits. I don't know, but if there's one thing I do know, it's that compared to Pizza Hut, Domino sucks. I also know now that the stupid wings pin that Finn has on his jacket is a capacitor that will allow him to travel through time. That was easy. And hopefully he figures out soon because, oh, sh crap! Meteorites. The honest to God, first Sharknado appears off their little coast and they ride Terra's dactyl and blow up the NATO by smacking meteorites into it. Ten. Shockingly, this does not work. So Finn jumps off the dino onto a flying shark and forces it to eat some meteors. Then they knock that into the tornado and this does work. Although it does create a, I don't even want to say it. I shouldn't have to, this is my video. It's a time NATO. And then we get title cards and there are some kind of 90s animation vibes. And also there's a new take on the theme song. So that's nice. Okay, love is dead. Back to the movie. The first Sharknado has been destroyed, but they only managed to ride their dinosaur through time to some snowy medieval period with peasants tugging on rock swords and shit. A sassy drag queen cameo witch mistakes the dino for a dragon and shoots it down. Nailed it. Also, Brian transforms into a black woman. As far as I can tell, this is the only physical change anybody experiences in all this time traveling. But my guess is it's a way to explain why Dolph Lundgren isn't in the movie. Or maybe there's no thought behind anything and Brian just took a super long 
break on set and they decided to film with another actor in the meantime. Who knows? Maybe not our greatest idea. Things look dire, but thankfully somebody just hucks them a bag of era-ish appropriate clothes. <laughs> so they slip those on and are immediately confronted by the drag witch for a brief sword fight where a woman shows up and says the king says that they should stop, so the drag witch says, Bye! And to be completely honest, this character, Morgana, is easily the best thing that's happened to this series. Ugh. Those wretched words. The king inexplicably never actually shows up, but they're brought to Merlin's castle, so I guess this is all technically Camelot? There's apparently a prophecy of their one day arriving, specifically because Gil was here for the last 10 years, though he is currently buggering off on a boat. Bye! And Gil claimed more of his family would show up, I guess. Oh, and hey, there's Merlin. Be still. And it's Neil deGrasse Tyson probably experiencing extreme anal palpitations anytime something unscientific is said. It's a wormhole. <clears throat> oh, also apparently Black Lady Brian is no longer a history teacher, but I'm a physics teacher. <clears throat> I'm skeptical. No, Neil, that's misogynist. Bad Neil. I'm clench your asshole, you asshole. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Completely competent lady scientist Brian explains the tornadoes can be used to travel through time now, which I think we already knew from the last movie. Also, how is Gil here if he can't travel back in time? Like, didn't he already save everybody at a further point in time? I guess he's just <clears throat> working his way forward? They decide they can't interact with Gil because that'd make him stop searching for them and he'd never find them. So I guess that is the explanation. But no time to think about it any more deeper than that because, uh, oops, the head's out of the bag. <laughs> so let's spend five minutes just talking about the damned April head. Because that head is jealous. Neil says some stuff just to remind you that he's there and also that they clearly filmed him in front of a green screen in his personal bathroom 7,000 miles away from the other actors. And... <clears throat> Morgana comes back in and made me legitimately laugh out loud for I think the first and only time in this incredibly long series. I thought Merlin had sent you to the land of the undead. They were full. Can I come in? He, I googled this and I think that's correct, explains he has an anti-shark potion Shark repellent bat spray that he'll shoot into a newly developing Sharknado in exchange for them using the power of science to tug Excalibur out of its rock prison. Now, I thought destroying the mommy Sharknado was supposed to end the threat forever, but according to Wikipedia, Gil's time traveling has unleashed a bunch of other Sharknados throughout time, which... <laughs> Wardrobe change, Morgana shoots the potion into the tornado, but all it does is create fire-breathing sharks. Dragon sharks, if you will. This is a she-mergency. Now, Senator Morgana acts like this is some sort of trick or feint or something, but if that was the case, he should have waited until they already got him Excalibur, right? What's the point of not holding up your end of the bargain first? I don't know, but they kill some sharks for a bit, and some sharks kill them for a bit. Finn pulls out. Excalibur without the use of science, which is also probably how all of his children were accidentally conceived. Right, Dave? Like Excalibur is his penis? Also Excalibur, like Finn's penis, is a chainsaw. Then die! I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Ultimately, they blow up the Sharknado by, I think, electrifying the sharks and causing them to explode. It's all a little fuzzy because I don't give a shit anymore and this time beer is potent. Oh no. Then to achieve the requisite 88 miles per hour to traverse time without incest, despite that being literally the only good thing the movie has done besides boobs. See, that's what I mean, I mean, God. I can't believe I'm, I'm actually gonna feel up my own mother. They sit their white and Brian asses down in a catapult <laughs> and launch to the 1700s with an assist from Neil deGrasse Tyson's Dino Mount. Now this is a time period where Brian is no longer a woman, thank God on a couple of levels. And I know that's what you were going to say, Dave. You're a regular Neil over here, Dave. You hate women, you hate Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for my apology video. You can start your own channel. That's just apology videos for every video that <laughs> I release. <laughs> anyway, Paul Revere is here, so I guess it's the Revolutionary War. The British are coming! And I'll just say it. 
I am actually digging this movie much more than the others. For once, I can't really anticipate what's going to happen next, which is a major plus. They're captured by the Americans and taken to Benjamin Franklin, played by Leslie Jordan, which is sad. Benjamin Franklin is dead. Crank him, crank him. A Sharknado forms off the coast, which the British intend to leverage to destroy the Americans, so Finn and the team convince Franklin to let them explain to Daryl Hammond how he can use his cannons to destroy the Sharknado. <laughs> oh, sorry, Daryl Hammond is playing George Washington. Nice. There's some thrilling back and forth here before Hammond decides, fine, I'll shoot the cannons into the tornado. And then Finn gives a rousing speech about shooting cannonballs into lightning, so they become electrified and subsequently blow up the Sharknado. We gotta blow all the sharks! This is about as effective at inspiring the troops as telling them to electrify their own patriotic genitals, but eventually they come around and do as Finn demands. It works, obviously, and has the bonus effect of killing all the British, which, if I'm being honest, is also my goal with these videos. If we make a billion dollars, that's awesome, but if a couple of British war generals die, that's even better. I don't know if I like that joke, but it's there. And uh, if you've made it this far in the video, what are you gonna, you gonna sign off after that joke? Unsubscribe. <laughs> the eight people subscribed to my channel. Make that seven, bitch! Now who's with me? All this time travel wonkiness starts to get to Nova's pretty little head, so she writes a letter to her grandpa to warn him against going out to fish on that fateful day in the 90s. She tries to hand it to an ancestor of hers, but Finn stops her because if her grandpa isn't devoured by sharks, then Nova wouldn't gain the necessary shark tridge she needs to fight sharks in the present. Nova's like, I'd prefer to not become a sad sex object, and Finn is like, that's literally the whole reason I like you, and again, man, I wish they would just bone already. Stupid TV censorship restrictions. Massive Finn Nova Stan over here. Anyway, Finn Nova Stan definitely sounds like a country where <laughs> you are not allowed to have gay people play in your soccer games. No, we can't mess with destiny. Anyway, Finn rips up the letter, which is hot as shit. <laughs> and Nova angrily walks away, which is even hotter. God damn. Back at camp, April, of course, tells Franklin about using a big-ass key to harness electric energy, which will help them go fast, I guess. Brian, seemingly not super pumped about this idea, decides to stay behind because he's a history teacher, and this is, in fact, history. That's a metaphor! And also, there's really no need for his character anymore, if there ever was, and maybe he had to take another 30 minutes of runtime shit. Is there any place to get a... Taco. The rest of the team uses a wagon or carriage or whatever tied to a kite to blast their sweet asses to the Wild West. You know, that's the other reason I like this movie. They're still cramming in every dumb idea they can think of, but for basically the first time ever, we stick with an idea for 15 minutes and explore it rather than just drunkenly screaming, TORNADO, followed by a five second clip of a guy eating literal sh in a flying porta potty. I wish the entire series had the relative patience that this movie has. And speaking of, now we're watching Billy the Kid engage in yet another Mexican standoff with a cameo sheriff. Before they start shooting though, the crew appears out of thin air and kind of, you know, cock up the resulting shootout. <laughs> Finn is arrested while the girls hide in the wagon because nobody even thinks to check it, despite it possibly being a UFO housing visitors from another galaxy. Bigger sharks to fry, I guess. Speaking of, Sky from the second movie is there, having been inexplicably saved by Gil, but brought to this point in time instead of all the other points in time. Like, for example, the point where they brought in another black actress to play Brian instead of using a chocolate blast from the past. <laughs> she and the girls scheme to free Finn, who is currently in prison next to a dude who also has wings, which is for sure Gil, but somehow Gil doesn't recognize his own dad. And again, he's extremely not Dolph Lundgren, which it, it, it disappoints me greatly. Ah! Nova and Skye save Finn, and they go to save Gil before he's hanged. <laughs> Oh, shit, they hanged him. Now, usually that would break the hangee's neck, unless you're Brendan Fraser. <laughs> but fortunately, 
Yeah, this series isn't particularly interested in Gallo's mechanics, and they save Gil with a well-placed Nova Ring, not to be confused with a Nuva Ring. It does not protect against HIV and other STDs. And Gil uses the resulting shootout and inevitable Sharknado to make his escape. Luckily for him, he gets out before the single most forced joke in all of human or shark history. Red Shark! Two Shark! Red Shark! Blue Shark! <laughs> you were in Kill Bill. What happened? <laughs> Dr. Seuss is canceled, I think. It's hard to keep track. Hey, baby. How was school? Anyway, there's no clever attempt to destroy the Sharknado by force feeding a horse TNT or whatever. It, it, the April Head just shoots lasers at the thing, which he presumably could have done in any prior scenario. Then Billy the Kid demands to go to the future since that's what Gil said he'd help him do. But then... <laughs> Then they hop a train to gain the requisite speed to time travel to a surf rock music video. And say what I say after listening to any surf rock. Well, that sucked. Our cleverer and more astute viewers might have guessed that yes, even this surfy rocky group of boppers will soon be attacked by a Sharknado. But what you may not have guessed is that one random dude would fight the sharks with a laser gun. <laughs> The explanation, if there is such a thing in this series, is that these people are apparently Finn's parents, and they had just interacted with Gil, who apparently taught them how to build a laser gun. I mean, yes, Gil's been traveling through the past, but that doesn't mean he can't cobble a non-existent piece of technology together and then surf into a Sharknado. I mean, that Gil, what a damn dude. Oh my god, my foot's asleep. Get out of our way, big feet. Anyway, apparently Gil has also helped his parents build Another travel capacitor thing. Maybe it's my fault, but I literally don't understand why they do this or need to do this. What's wrong with the wings capacitor? Look. I'd Google it, but you can't make me. This is my channel, and I only do the shit I want to do. Oh, and also Gil also built them a huge ass laser cannon? Everybody hold on. Gil know how to do these things? I don't know, but they use it to blow up the tornado and I just realized, I guess they couldn't get Hasseldad for this scene, which is a damn shame. Is he, is he dead? Oh, thank God. So, okay, now they use the entirely redundant capacitor handheld thing in Finn's dad's sick ass car to travel back to the first movie to destroy that Sharknado because I think they are just, they're just doing shit at this point, except, ooh, it's betrayal! I have an extra ticket to the Spice Girls concert. Do you want to go? Nova has instead sent them to 1997 San Francisco in an attempt to save her grandpa and improve her leg skin. So they run up to grandpa and tween Nova, and it turns out that grandpa's a real hard ass about his boat fee. That'll be 20 bucks. That'll be 60 bucks. Also, the money they used has Brian's face on it, so I guess he became a president. Grandpa! Also, it's worth mentioning that young Nova looks nothing like current Nova. They don't even have the same eye color. I'm starting to suspect this movie didn't really send its actors back in time, but instead hired a random tween girl. They head out into the water, and Finn tries to convince Nova to let her grandpa f***ing die. <laughs> And she says, what I say anytime I can't remember the name of the milkman who serviced my dad's neighborhood in 1967. I need my grandpa. Man, they are really swinging for the emotional fences with this movie. I definitely empathize with the sudden realization that a thing you've loved is ending and everything about it to this point has been stupid bullshit. And you realize in the 11th hour, you desperately want to find a way to show that it actually kind of matters to you. And I also understand failing in that task miserably. I know. Speaking of weird emotional swings and misses, apparently somebody in the Revolutionary War managed to tape together Nova's letter, and it remains in the family to this day, even though that's basically insane. What? But that's what happened in Back to the Future, so Sharknado is obliged to follow. Yes, this means we can still get more incest out of this movie somehow if we believe hard enough. What are we doing standing around? Come on, we want to f***ed, right? Somehow, that revelation convinces Nova to let her dumbass grandpa die. Just kidding. She's still not willing to do that and attempts to steer the ship away from the sharks, but 
just manages to crash it into a reef and has a brief, oh no, I'm the reason my grandpa dies moment, even though that makes no sense because little her is there and fully aware of big voluptuous her. If this is how it always went, she definitely remember, I can't, I can't get those things out of my mind. There's some big ones out there. Fortunately, her moment of doubt crystallizes for Finn that actually no, he should save grandpa. <laughs> So now they're in save grandpa mode and Nova yells a bastardized princess bride quote at the sharks. My name is Nova Clark. You killed my grandfather. Prepare to Which A, works a lot better when talking to another human and B, suggests that princess bride never existed in this universe or it did exist and these people are so callous and flippant that they make terrible jokes and references for nobody even as they potentially have to watch their grandpa die would be absolutely totally and in all other ways either way not my favorite thing ever son of a bitch from there things go to shit just like they always do at this exact point in the past three movies april's head falls in the water nova gets chomped full-bodied april falls in they're just like they're just like all dead basically even worse finn's having connectivity issues with his he makes shift router, and again, why does he use this thing in the first place? I typed your symptoms into the thing up here and it says you could have network connectivity problems. But Finn hooks a shark that I guess we're supposed to believe can travel at speeds exceeding 88 miles per hour, and he and Skye, who I forgot was with them until this moment, end up in a post-apocalyptic future in the year 20,013. And you might think it's loud here, but actually, damn it's quiet. <gasps> Finn is accosted by a drone shark and then a bunch of Aprils pop out and then Sky says, it's Planet of the Aprils. And I hope somebody out there can laugh at these little moments because I cannot. They capture Finn and Sky and take them to some weird cloning factory thing overseen by Queen April who uncuffs them. Apparently she's the reattached head of Robot April. What's in the box? And she spent 10,000 years being pissed for Finn, never plumbing the ocean for her lost head. And then another 10,000 years forgiving Finn and wanting to jump his bones, even though that's technically 2,000 years too many between 2013 to 2013. But, you know, we've gotten this far. We really think they're gonna do the math. She's been cloning herself from the real April who she keeps in a Barbie box for some reason, because as she explains, you can't clone robots. And as we all know, it's much easier to clone a human than build a sex robot, sex robot. Though that does explain why Dr. Busey decided to rebuild his daughter's boobs as robot twins rather than do not that. Sky gets blasted and electrocuted and Finn begs for her life in just the most powerful way. It's legitimately moving. Stop, please. <laughs> Sky is carbonated and now evil April wants to clone Finn so she can bang him forever. And also, Finn tries to kill evil April with some sort of future saw, but she's made of titanium, and the real April somehow wakes up and punches evil April, and they fight, and it's all very much a movie. And then they sort of electrocute each other, allowing Finn to use the capacitor to float away to the short film that kicked off this whole goddamn thing. I'm not gonna lie, it's a little confusing for them not to actually travel to any of the important parts of the first movie, even if just for nostalgia shake, but okay. Here we are at that intro from the first movie and they find April's head in the water and now she's nice because he came back for her, even though it's still 16 years later and not particularly close to San Francisco, but yeah, what a hero. Finn tells the weirdos on the boat that the head is nuclear and they'd all better be careful with it. And April shoots a few lasers at the sharks, but says she needs to recharge even though she's been doing nothing but charging for a decade and a half, implying that Dr. Busey made her from a bunch of iPhones. So Finn enlists the help of the captain who shows him to their gun closet where they also keep a chainsaw in case they need to cut down some ocean trees. Like if the ocean trees fight back. And with those items, well, they kill some sharks until Ahab is sucked into the storm and explodes and then April becomes fully charged and gives insanely powerful head. Gil shows up and it's actually an evil fake April from the future and she doesn't want the NATO destroyed because that destroys her version of the future but then they're basically they're all sucked into the storm and the capacitor flips out and starts bringing in all sorts of random crap throughout history like Cleopatra and Muhammad Ali and I bet there are some really killer cameos in this section but I don't know anybody and then both the Aprils end up with sharks and have lasers and Finn's doing his best to let it all sink in. 
again, and eventually he explodes evil April and collapses time, I guess, and oh, okay. Now it is the first movie. Awkward stand-in for the dead actor and everything. They're now in a world where Sharknado's never existed, but every character is still doing great. Except maybe Hasseldad, who couldn't be here, but wrote a kind letter in huge, childlike Sharpie scribbles like a six-year-old who fell off a horse. Or like, my cousin who fell off the dirt bike. <laughs> Finn is leaving his bar to Sugar Ray and going to start a tree trimming business and gives one last speech. Gonna miss all your faces. <laughs> and I didn't realize until this exact moment that multiple actors played Matt. Maybe I'll go back in and write a joke about how the army really changed Matt's appearance or something. Or maybe I won't. We're already at like 20,000 words or something. You'll be fine. Oh, and we're out of time anyway because April creates a water NATO from her crotch. Your water broken? And apparently it's a perfect day all across America because Matt Lauer and Jared Fogle are both dead by sharks in this universe. Amen and amen. Okay, just one last beer and the beer NATO will subside. Okay. Like you've watched it now? Have I you? Feel like I've watched have it. you lived it? I don't need to watch it on screen.